forward. And we need to examine the, our, our past with a certain amount of honesty and integrity about the things that we've been involved in. This four part series will showcase the work of many social work scholars examining social works past and will provide concepts and strategies for the way forward for our profession. So please enjoy the presentations. I hope you will engage our presenters in robust discourse um, and that we will move towards some critical changes in our profession. And I will turn it over to my colleague, Sandra. Greetings, everyone. I join my colleagues, Laura Allen and James Herbert, in welcoming you to this important symposium. Uh, Howard University is very pleased to be a part of this exciting moment of change. I pause today to celebrate veterans who are joining us. On yesterday, Veterans Day, I was reminded of my late father, who was a World War II veteran. Like many African Americans, my dad fought for his country and returned home to a country that did not fully value him as a citizen. Yet, he and other African Americans did not retreat in the face of pernicious racism. They did not accept the status quo. They organized the Double V campaign and insisted on liberty abroad as well as liberty at home. Thus, today's symposium honors that tradition of advocacy through elevating our voices for change in the systems that hold us captives to the past. The time is now. To elevate our voices, we must build upon the hard fought legacies of our ancestors who fought for social justice. Many like Howard's founding dean, Dr. Annabel Burns Lindsay in the 1950s insisted that the profession honor its values and ends uh, discrimination such as segregated field placements and other discriminatory practices that were counted to what countered to what we stated our, our values were, our values of social justice. She and other champions of the time rejected the status quo. Today, we must continue to reject practices that intentionally or unintentionally oppress brown and black persons and keep us at the bottom of the quality of life measures. We cannot sit in the comfort of our past accomplishments and hide behind good intentions that fail to generate new ideas and better outcomes. Now is the time for us to examine our history and point out the missed opportunities for our profession to be center stage uh, in the fight for radical social justice and anti-racist practices that harm segments of our society. In partnership with our students, our new generation of social justice warriors, we must work to dismantle the caste system described by Isabel Wilkerson in her book and recognize that the underlying condition of racism is killing us at unprecedented rates. What's at stake? The answer is simple, our humanity. Lives depend upon us building, uh, building upon our strengths, making a U-turn when necessary, and paving new roads. The status quo is no longer an option for us. We cannot be stagnant. In alignment with our theme, the way forward is through reckoning with our history, interrogating our present, and reimagining our future. Won't you join us in our journey as we really cover these topics today? Thank you so much, and I'm sorry for the technical delay. Um, Sandra warmly uh, inspired us here, and so we're gonna, we're gonna move forward. Again, my name is Laura Abrams. I am a professor and chair at UCLA Luskin Social Welfare, and I'm joined with my co-organizers, um, Alan Detlaff, Dean at the University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work, James Herbert Williams, Director of Social Work at Arizona State University, 
and Cedric, Sandra Edmonds Crew, the Dean at Howard University School of Social Work. This is the first of our four part symposium. Um, and as you can see, we've laid out the parts in different segments throughout this year. And I think what we want to impress upon our um, audience and all the presenters and our community is that this work um, is, it is ongoing and we wanted to make sure that this wasn't one event. And so this is continuing throughout this entire academic year and we hope to inspire um, further um, symposiums, writings, dialogues and events. Today we launch in the part one, so social work's historical legacy of racism and white supremacy and we're glad to have you here. We start in part one by considering critical issues in how social work has been crafted and viewed through a lens of white supremacy. Our unique role as a helping profession and largely a women's profession has also put us in direct control and position of coercion, racialization and exclusion in the name of benevolence and sometimes in the name of justice. So what does it mean to reckon with our past? Reckoning, a term was regularly used, we heard, um, especially after the murder of George Floyd, when social work was touted as the softer savior of policing. Many suggested, how can we be a substitute for policing if we haven't reckoned with our own past? We have not ourselves been a panacea to solve anti-Black racism. And as Sandra mentioned, we've continued to perpetuate harm on communities of color. So here we call for deeper critical conversation. Um, and and here's, here's what we're going to do today and tomorrow. First, we want to acknowledge that the discourses and practices of white supremacy have indeed shaped social work, but how have they done so? We see this in practices of exclusion, exclusion, displacement, and othering, of judgment and practices carried out by so-called well-intentioned actors with consequences of inflicting legacies of harm on communities of color, on women, on LGBTQ populations, particularly with regard to family separation and other practices of exclusion. White supremacy has also guided the lens through which we currently learn our history. And we hope that these panels will become prominent in, under, in better understanding our profession at large. Next, we want to acknowledge the intersectionalities in considering our history. We recognize that with social work, like other helping professions, we are a service fulfilled largely by women and the intersections in teaching apart the history of gender and race is critical. Even in a profession devalued as care work, social workers have also had the power to shape and enforce racial hierarchies, discourses and practices. Women's history to a large extent has many overlaps with social work as we see in tracing the movements in the work of the Settlement House reformers and progressive era all the way through the present. Third, we want to acknowledge that we're not starting from a blank slate here. We have sources in the form of case notes. We are fortunate to have these sources, although they tend to eclipse the client view, they are a good window to social work history. We have scholars to draw from. We have historians in our profession and without. We have social work scholars who've done amazing historical work, such as Iris Carlton Linnae, who's unearthed many stories of black women social work leaders that are often eclipsed from our mainstream texts. We have historians outside the profession, such as Dorothy Roberts, Linda Gordon, who've placed a particularly critical lens on our history of welfare, child welfare, and other practices. In other words, tracing social work's complicated relationship to racism 
and white supremacy has a foundation. And here in this symposium today and tomorrow, we extend this work into four clusters of scholarship. Today, we have two panels, race making and through the child welfare and juvenile courts. And these are three papers that tie together how the early courts dealing with children's issues, a premier social work child saving institution, establish racial hierarchy around worthy and unworthy, around gender and motherhood that often persist today. In the second panel, social work, immigration and displacement, we have a group of scholars that reckon with social work's role in creating and perpetuating discourses and practices around immigration, othering, and even omission from history. Unearthing this history is important in terms of addressing the populations that we've not previously studied. Tomorrow we have two panels, Reckoning with Coercion, Legacies of White Supremacy, and all three of these papers consider various aspects of social workers' positionality in the institutional spaces of mental health, welfare, citizenship, and education. And last Friday afternoon or midday uh, Pacific time, we have a final section on three papers that consider how social work, research, settlement houses, and policies have been used to reinforce segregation sometimes even in the name of race progress. We also, these papers also deal with community development as a distinctly racialized enterprise. I'm excited. <laughs> Just a couple of technical notes. Um, all of the panels will be available for later viewing on YouTube and we will have time for questions so please type them into the chat and we have doctoral student volunteers from UCLA Luskin who are going to be cataloging the questions for our Q&A session. And before we move forward to the first panel, I want to thank Renia Butler um, who's organized all of this fabulous technology uh, from University of Houston Graduate College of Social Work Kenise Warren, the Communications Director at Houston, Dominique McKell, who's organized us from UCLA, who's a PhD student and a wonderful scholar, and all of our authors and volunteers, and our four institutions that are sponsoring this homegrown conference that um, kind of exploded into uh, something that I think um, we didn't necessarily expect, so we're very excited. I'm going to pass the baton back to Sandra. Um, again, my name is Laura Abrams. I'm the host for part one, and I'm really, really excited to launch this event. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. I am excited as well. And I am the host for part two. So I want to make sure after you are you take in all of the information today and tomorrow that you come back on January 28th and 29th for the second part of this. During the second part, we're going to have reflections on past and present, addressing racism from within the profession. We're going to have four panels. The first one is going to talk about women of color, enduring and confronting racism within the profession. The second panel is going to address social work education, combating racism in practice and theory. The third panel will talk about calling out racism through uprooting whiteness. Again, uh, we will uh, dig more into the topics. And the fourth panel will be transforming practice through resistance, innovation in services, programs, and organizations. So make sure you're holding those dates, Thursday and Friday, January 28th and 29th. And we are excited to present part one and for you to hold the date for part two. Thank you. Okay, hello again, everyone. Um, I'm glad you're all here. 
Um, again, my name is Laura Abrams from UCLA Luskin Social Welfare, and I'll be your host for part one and for also the morning session. Um, in this session um, today, we're going to be talking about child welfare and race making or race making through the child welfare and juvenile courts. Um, as I mentioned, we have a panel of scholars doing primary source work and historical research. And these papers tie together really nicely in thinking about how the early formation of the courts um, both created racial hierarchy, but also practices of inclusion and exclusion in regard to who families and children considered worthy and unworthy. Um, and this is also an area I have a particular passion because a lot of my early work studied the juvenile courts. Um, and so I'm excited to, um, to move forward with our, with our group. So in our first paper, um, let me just bring up my notes here. Okay. So our first paper will be um, from um, authors Jenny Jones and Kristen Haynes. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Hi, Jenny, you're ready. All right, Hi, I'm gonna introduce our, um, our panelists. Jenny Jones is the Dean and Professor of Whitney M. Young Jr. School of Social right. Work at Clark and on the graduate faculty at Florida State University. Sir, of which Dr. Dr. Jones has over 22 years of professional social work experience in higher education. She has authored or edited more than 45 scholarly publications, reports, and monographs. So we're excited to welcome Dr. Jones, as well as Kristen Haynes who's a doctoral candidate at Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey in family science and human development. And her work focuses on the black mother-daughter relationship. She also has professional experience in the social work field. Um, and they are going to be speaking today about institutional racism in the child welfare system. So welcome Dr. Jones and Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am really excited to have an opportunity to talk with you about a, a focus of practice, an area of practice that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, child welfare work is a huge part of my professional uh, practice life prior to coming into academe. So uh, today, I hope that you will uh, enjoy this presentation and have lots of good questions to stimulate some conversation about this practice. Kristen? Hi, everyone. My name is Kristen Haynes. Um, I am a doctoral candidate at Montclair State University in Family Science and Human Development. This topic is very near and dear to my heart. I started out in child welfare in Florida during the opioid crisis. So I've had um, my foundation is child welfare. So I'm really excited today um, to present not only with my program director when I was in the MSW program, but one of my mentors, Dr. Jones, it's an honor. So thank you for having me. Okay. Um, I always like to start these presentations with some type of quote that I think that best captures what we're going to be talking about. And today we're talking about institutional racism. So I wanna to read to you a quote by Tanya A. Cooper. Unconscious racism is embedded in our civic institutions and the foster care system is, a, is vulnerable as one such institution controlled and influenced by those in power. Those in power in turn may unwittingly disseminate discriminate, I'm sorry, discriminate against people of color, which history demonstrates. This presentation today is, is divided up into several, several parts. I want to start by giving you the significance of the problem, and that is the background and historical overview of child abuse reporting law. Uh, we're going to talk about that. We're going to take you from the background and historical overview to talking about the impact of uh, the child abuse uh, Prevention and Treatment Act 
1974 and how it's what's what its impact is on black families. We're going to talk about the disproportionality of child abuse reporting on black families, as well as the disproportionality of COVID-19 and its impact on black families. Our paper for this presentation uses firsthand accounts from practice and research. I think you heard both Christian and I talk about our practice experience and child welfare has also been my research area, research focus uh, since I came into the academy. The paper analyzes the racist origins within child welfare, including how negative stereotypical beliefs about black people and family life translates into policies and practices that have ultimately separated more families than it has stabilized. Early child abuse reporting laws. The first law was enacted in the state of California in 1963. Um, uh, by 1966, all states had reporting laws. Before uh, uh, the Child Abuse and Prevention Treatment Act came about, uh, mandated reporters under this um, law were primarily physicians who reported physical abuse. Since that law, since this law in 1963 was uh, enacted, uh, various amendments came about to it. Uh, uh, some of those amendments have expanded the definition of child abuse and the persons required to report. Because remember, we're talking about in 1963 when it first came about, uh, the, the, the mindset was uh, abuse occurred, doctors were the ones that could report abuse and that's where it was primarily seen in doctor's office and we're talking about physical abuse. Uh, again, in uh, 1974, the Child Abuse Prevention Treatment Act came about that was federal legislation that addressed child abuse and neglect and that was enacted in January 31, 1974. Multiple amendments have been made to that act. Uh, uh, that act was last reauthorized in December uh, 2010. Uh, again, in 2015, 2016, and 2018. Most recently, certain provisions of that act were amended as recently as January 7, 2019. So when a part of this act um, allowed for demonstration programs and it provided financial assistance to these programs for the prevention and treatment of child abuse and neglect. And it also established the National Center on Child Abuse and Neglect. Additionally, there were grants and contracts for training programs for professional and paraprofessional um, personnel. However, with this, um, what we're seeing is that what we got was a lack of cultural competence for Black family life. Typically, what we were seeing is that colorblind ideology where we group all minorities together instead of being able to highlight the unique experiences of minorities allow for the Black family experience, I would say, um, to not be fully understood and for people to teach from that perspective. What we really need are innovative programs and projects, because if we center the Black family experience, we're then able to create parenting courses, prevention and treatment for drug-related child abuse and neglect that actually show promise in preventing traces of cases of child abuse and neglect. But where we see some systematic, some systematic barriers is that we found that um, in the process of procuring federal contracts, there's a history of underfunding minority businesses, especially businesses led by black women. And what this means and translates for individuals in the child welfare system is that individuals who may have a idea or even have the cultural competence to be able to create a program or implement um, programming for the black family because of systematic barriers in our federal contracting system, the likelihood of them receiving this type of programming is very slim. Yeah, and, and as you heard me say earlier on, my uh, I had many years of practice experience prior to coming into uh, the academy. And uh, I spent about 17 years in the child welfare arena doing various jobs. I had the opportunity to work through in that system from the 
the moment of, of taking a kid into custody up through uh, post uh, adoptions. So I've had a pretty good, uh, pretty strong, expansive practice experience in this area. So when I came into the academy, the opportunity to uh, look at research around those practice issues that I had experienced was exciting to me because I wanted to see kind of where all this came together and, and, and where some of the gaps were. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk to you now about uh, the most impactful uh, experience I had as a child welfare worker uh, in, in Los Angeles, California during the 1980s and 90s. That experience came when uh, I worked for children's services at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. Uh, that is the era that changed black families in the child welfare system. From 1985 to 1983, the number of reports of abuse and neglect increased by 70% 70, 70 from 42 to 71 per 1,000 children. Between 1987 and 1988 and in 1994 and 95, the number of children served by the child welfare services system after controlling for changes in population increased 27%. In 1994, these are some startling statistics, over 664 reports of child abuse and neglect and about 90,000 children were in foster care. And I worked in a region uh, in Southern California, uh, a part of the city uh, that was uh, primarily uh, black and brown people. And during that, that time uh, of, of the crack cocaine epidemic, the rate of children coming into foster care, uh, of coming, moving out of out of home care into foster care, some into relative caregivers home was overwhelming. There was almost not enough uh, homes to take the children, to take care of those children. What we saw during the crack cocaine area is violence and property crime going up. Both uh, increased roughly by 4% due to crack over the period of 1984 and 89. We saw large rise in homicide uh, associated with crack cocaine with the doubling of homicide victimization of black males ages 14 to 17, a 30% increase for black males ages 18 to 24, and 10% increase in black males 25 and older. We saw a proliferation of babies, crack crack cocaine and mothers. We saw a proliferation of babies being born uh, uh, by to mothers who were addicted to crack cocaine. Um, uh, oftentimes, crack, co crack cocaine users were involved in sex works, which is what contributed to so many uh, unwanted pregnancies, babies being born, uh, the acceleration and the spread of AIDS and unwanted birth of low-weight babies occurred during that period of time. I'd also, Dr. Jones, would like to highlight that during this time as well, um, Dr. Dorothy Roberts um, wrote an article, Prison, Foster Care, and the Systematic Punishment of Black Mothers. And they talk about in 1990, one in four Black children had at least one parent incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the statistics with children being born low birth weight babies, um, 20 to 100 percent of an observed increases in black low birth weight babies, fetal death, child mortality and unwed births occurred in large cities between 1984 and 1989, which happened to also coincide with the height of the crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. So. Um, while I have didn't have 17 years in child welfare, I had about seven. And, um, when I started my career, it was at the height of the opioid crisis here in Florida. And what I found was that come because I, because I have had experience, whether that was personally or in my community with crack cocaine, I was very familiar. I was very familiar in how in which the system treated individuals who were users of crack cocaine. 
And when I became a social worker, I saw the difference um, in the systematic difference in how crack cocaine users were viewed and opioid users. Um, and at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic, the face of the users were black Americans. So in turn, we they were su subjected to strict mandatory sentencing, accounting for the mass incarceration of black family members. And many users are still in prison today. Going back to the statistics that I gave you, that by 14 in 1990, one in four black children had at least one, per one parent in prison. Now, fast forwarding to 2012, when I was a, is I was a Division C case manager, how opioid users were viewed is because majority of the users were white, and they were seen more as having a mental illness versus how um, crack user, crack cocaine users were seen as having whether that was a moral deficit. And I witnessed repeat offenders with opioids. Um, for child neglect, we offered reunification case plans. I saw a lot of leniency within the court systems that um, I had parents on my caseload who were crack cocaine users that did not receive the same prep the same types of treatment. Opioid, opioid users were not the recipients of strict mandatory sentencing, which has allowed their family units to, re to remain intact. And the difference that I would like to highlight is that Many, many black families are still, we're talking about second and third generations. We are still seeing the effects of crack cocaine um, users in the family, whether that's family members are in prison or whether we're seeing that children were in foster care and age out of foster care. We keep, we're seeing that. Also, Christian, we, I want to just point out with the opioid epidemic, you know, the country identify the opioid epidemic as a public health issue. Absolutely. Whereas crack cocaine is for those of us on this on this part of the broadcast that's old enough to remember that for crack cocaine it was it just a, a, a tragedy, a felony. Uh, it was the worst thing that could ever happen in our society. In return, how people think about or label issues have a lot to do with how people are treated that are experiencing those issues. Absolutely. Um, what can we learn from our past and how um, COVID-19 child welfare and black families will fare? What we do know is that black families are disproportionately impacted by COVID. And history has shown that poor black families are penalized in our child welfare system. So we're seeing with COVID, COVID has virtually transformed every facet of American life from how we work, how we learn, and how we socialize. Our social systems, including the U.S. child welfare system, has been a part of that change. The child welfare system currently is serving more than 3.5 million children annually and employs tens of thousands of people nationwide. Child welfare systems rely on in-person contact and shift from face-to-face -face contact to virtual contact which has raised concerns about systematic racism. While the child welfare case reports have dropped nationwide, there continues to be an overrepresentation of black and brown children. It has remained the same. And when we look at reasons for this overrepresentation, we see higher proportion of reports due to high risk abuse or neglect reports rather than low, low level concerns. What we're also seeing is issues of substance abuse and sources of support is limited due to the pandemic, and also incidents of family violence has increased. What we are seeing right now is that adversity faced by families involved in the child welfare system currently is arguably greater than it has ever been in the 50 year history of the modern child welfare system. So I'm gonna throw it back to Dr. Jones. Thank you, Kristen. I, I just want to wrap up by saying that, um, uh, again, this is a, a, a research area for me that's near and dear to my heart that is grounded in and based on my work as a uh, child welfare services worker. And there's so many things that, that comes up about this, about this particular topic. And now 
Uh, and, and we're talking about from my past work, when we move forward to where we are now, we can see the impact again that COVID is having on black and brown families. And we are seeing um, a number, again, as Christian reported, the, the, the reports have gone down because uh, the, the reports that were usually made around um, issues related to poverty or, or, or um, neglect uh, now are the reports are more around the, the issue around domestic violence because families are confined to their home. Uh, many of the families that we work with in the child welfare system are, are usually in smaller spaces and those spaces does not always accommodate comfortably the number of people that live in them. And so uh, we're seeing a lot of of domestic violence because of partners coming in and out or or being there together as well. And with domestic violence cases, children get hurt. So so we see that. So these issues are not to be to be taken uh, lightly. Um, I um, also uh, think that when we talk about this adversity, you know, I cannot overstate that our families that are involved in this system are is a great. Uh, we are at a greater height than ever before around um, 50 years of history in this child welfare system. I just hope that um, as an as a academician now, that I am able to help uh, train students uh, who are entering into this field and share with them the research as well as uh, my practice-based experience around what this looks like and how they can uh, work with families and approach families. I think we as a profession, as a social work profession, are going to need to do a lot of work with our students to, to help them look, be able to uh, move, in, move in these spaces in a way that's respectful, while at the same time taking care um, of families and children in that, that are on our caseloads. So uh, I think we've run out of time, Kristen, and we're going to end it here. If you'd like more information about this topic or you want to be in touch with us, our information is on the screen. I will be more than happy to share any uh, information that I have. And I think Christian will uh, be equally as uh, happy with that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, so just for the audience, um, please uh, type some questions in the chat and we are going to get to them to each presenter at the end. Um, so we will log them. We will not forget about this wonderful presentation and any questions that you have. One thing I, you know, I was thinking about um, during your presentation and something maybe we can talk about after is the connection between that you trace between these public health crises and racial disproportionality in the sense, you know, that of um, crack cocaine, COVID, violence, those are public health issues, right? And so um, how we've dealt with them in the sense of depression and family disruption for black families and children um, is something that we, I think we need to tease apart a little bit in the, when we have time to talk um, after the next presentation. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Jones and Kristen, that was wonderful. And we're gonna get to your questions um, at the end. We're, and now I'm gonna introduce our next group. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, our next panel, um, is, our next presentation is from Denied to Disproportionality, How Racism Has Shaped Child Welfare Practice. And I'm very pleased to welcome um, a team of three authors, Dr. Joan Blakely, who is a tenured associate professor and researcher at Tulane University School of Social Work. Um, she received her doctorate from the University of Chicago, uh, SSA, and she also, um, her research is on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and I've read a lot of your research. I'm very excited to have you. Welcome. Uh, we also have Ray Stevenson, 
who is a second year doctoral student uh, at in city culture and community at Tulane University. And her researchers research focuses on education policy. And we have Dr. Marva Lewis, who is also from Tulane, um, an associate professor in the School of Social Work. And her work focuses on the development of culturally va valid research methods and measures of racism-based stress during pregnancy. Um, so thank you all for joining us and I'll let you uh, take it away from here. Again, from denied to disproportionality, how racism has shaped child welfare practice. Good morning. I am so excited uh, to be with you. I think we we really um, took this opportunity to really kind of delve into the history of the child welfare system. Um, I This is certainly my area. Um, and so when um, this call was put out by uh, Dr. Cruz, Dr. Detlef, Dr. Williams, and Dr. Abrams, um, it was for me, was an exciting time to just be able to think about and reflect on uh, child welfare history. I think that um, the, the beginning of our presentation is really about the crossroads. And I think that in so many ways in our society, we are at a crossroads and in, in, in terms of which way are we going, going to go? And I see that child welfare is that. And so today we want to really talk about um, sort of, you know, what racism looks like in the child welfare system, um, how we got here and where we go from here. And so um, again, my name is Joan Blakey. I'll let my my coworker or my co-presenters uh, introduce themselves and then we'll get right into it. Hi, I'm Marie Stevenson. I'm a PhD student in the UCD Culture and Community Program at Tulane. Hi, my name is Marva Lewis and I am a, an associate professor at Tulane University. I work with the um, National Safe Babies Court Team as a, a national consultant on racial disparities in the child welfare system. My research focuses on parent-child attachment and how culture can be used as a tool for, for uh, strengthening those parent-child um, relationships. Great. So thank you so much for putting this symposium together. I'm excited to share uh, what we um, found found uh, during our research. So as a social work student at a 4E Child Welfare Scholar, we learned a lot about proportionality and disparities. We learned that African-American children were um, 1.8 times more likely to enter the child welfare system that they were more likely to um, remain in foster care, um, less likely to be reunified and less likely to be adopted. That um, I started at CPS at a time um, when ASPA was, was uh, rolling out. And so the ASPA is the Adoption Safe Families Act um, in 19, 1997. And this uh, policy really changed um, the course of practice. It changed it such that um, time limits were now uh, implemented and um, that families had um, just a limited amount of time to demonstrate that they could care for their children. And so I was coming in at a time when um, was learning how to not only do this work, but how to um, do it in and, and to help families in sort of a, a limited amount of time. The explanations that were offered at that time were that, you know, substance abuse was the issue. Certainly crack cocaine, as Dr. Jones had mentioned, uh, was a, a, you know, a part of the, the landscape. Um, poverty was um, also, you know, a, a huge, um, we talked a lot about that. Um, we also talked about, you know, the, the fallacy that, you know, African-American families were more abusive than other types of families. But the, the one thing that we never really talked about was racism. We never talked about that there was structural racism going on in the system. And so it wasn't until I became um, a worker in this system that I began to really see um, that, that we were talking about two different systems. I saw bias play out from the caseworkers to um, supervisors, uh, to judges, to lawyers. Every 
aspect of the child welfare system, I began to see changes and differences. For white families, I felt that I saw that the the system was supportive, um, that we were you know providing with the resources, that families were given the benefit of the doubt when there were you know sort of questions. That the the goal was to return kids as quickly as possible. Whereas with the black families, it was more about punishment and correction. Um, that we is you know that many people assumed the worst of these families, that um, Black families had to ensure that everything was addressed before reunif reunification could happen. So if housing was an issue, they had to you know, deal with that, that the more that we were involved in the system, we might have gotten involved with this family for um, you know, educational neglect. But as we began to get more involved with the family, then substance abuse became an issue, then mental health became an issue, then housing became an issue. And so all of these things started to happen where these families had to really deal with all these things before we could reunify children. And so, you know, at, as a worker, I was really distressed about seeing, seeing this. Um, and so began to really advocate for, for families. And so I started um, COMAC, which is the Commission on Minnesota's African-American Children. And I started this organization because um, there were many people working on issues of disproportionality in the system. The problem was that we were all kind of working on it in our own little silos, our own little areas. And so we really, um, I really felt that we needed to come together to work on and, and push for change in the system. And so, you know, this organization um, did that. We also were uh, about educating the, educating the African-American community around um, issues of disproportionality and racism and what was happening in the system. Many um, African-American families were, un, or African-American people were unaware of the things that were happening. For example, in Minnesota, um, if there was a child that was under seven, um, that they only had, they, they, the parents had six months to, um, deal with the issues and, um, you know, to get their children back. Um, otherwise they would, uh, we would start with, um, terminating parental rights. And so not only was the, if a child under seven, but if a child was a part of a sibling group, and any of those children were under seven, they were all um, fast tracked under this system. And so really um, began to see how policies that were happening uh, were really affecting the numbers. And like I said, largely the African-American community was unaware of what was happening in child welfare practice. And so COMAC's uh, role also was to really think about and help the, educate the community on policies and this in this area. A system cannot fail those it was never built to protect. Um, this quote is a powerful tool for measuring the child welfare system. Um, is it failing or is it working exactly as it was designed to work? Um, when we place the child welfare system in its historical context, we can see that none of our current statistics about disproportionality are actually surprising. Um, we can see that racism has sort of been inseparable from its mission from the start. So only a few decades before child welfare started to become an organized system, black people were still enslaved. Um, whiteness was still the measure of what it meant to be human. Um, at this time, some of the most powerful people in our land were producing scientific research about black and indigenous peoples. Um, this research was used to justify egregious acts of violence and removal of sacred ancestral land. So America fights this bloody war over slavery. And Abraham Lincoln famously writes, if I could save the union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I, would save, if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored colored race, I do it because I believe it helps save the union. So e even this sort of war for our our the soul of our country is really about the union. It's not about the humanity of black people. So ten years after this this happens, um, that's when we get the first child protection entity. 
Um, and so at that time, when the idea of child protection was beginning to gain traction, um, black children are still barely considered human, let alone children. Um, so as the nation begins to imagine how to protect children, it's also putting children, putting non-white children in peril through state sanctioned terror. Um, on the timeline, you can also see that there are other things happening to other non-white groups at the time, like the Japanese internment camps where we're saying like, we have this internal contradiction already where we're saying we are an agency that protects children, but we also have a state that is willing and able to imperil children if they are not white. Um, so already the, the mission of child welfare is sort of in tension with um, what the state is doing, unless we think about child welfare as an agency that is designed to protect white children. So organized child protection emerged from the rescue of um, a white child called Mary Ellen Wilson um, in 1874, um, who lived with her guardians in one of New York's worst tenements, Hell's Kitchen, in Hell's Kitchen. Um, she was routinely beaten and neglected, and a religious missionary to the poor named Etta Wheeler learned about her plight and tried to rescue her. Um, she went to the police. The police were not able to do anything. They weren't willing to investigate. Um, she went to charities, but they didn't have the authority to sort of infiltrate the family. So there's no CPS, um, and Wheeler eventually goes to the ASPCA, um, which is obviously the, the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. And through the ASPCA, she's able to find a legal mechanism to help this child. So that's that's where CPS is coming from. It's saying like, all right, we, <laughs> we've, we're protecting animals, let's also protect children. Um, black children at this point do not get the benefit of CPS. Um, they're excluded from child welfare services and up until the end of World War II. So until this point, animals have a more robust and organized system of protection than black children do. There are like orphan asylums for black children, but they're woefully inferior, they're overcrowded. Um, so you can see over time, only 3% of agencies, child caring agencies that work for black children, um, were for black children specifically. So designed with them in mind. Um, only 25% accepted all races. 5% took specifically took non-white children, but not black children. And then 66% are reserved um, for white children only. 66%. So African-American children start to enter the foster care system during the 1950s. And interestingly, that is also when foster care policies start to get much more punitive. So when we look back at this timeline, where in this timeline did we meaningfully address how we got here? Like where in this timeline did do we reconcile this exclusion and this design around white children. Where in this timeline did we meaningfully reimagine this system to make sense for black children and families? Because our, our timeline simply goes from protecting white children to reluctantly allowing black children in to becoming much stricter and more punitive now that black children are here. Um, and that's that's what I've got. And what we what we want to end on in terms of the messages we would like you all to take away from this this brief discussion that we've had on the history of this system, a system that has oppressed and targeted specifically black and brown families and children. Um, as I introduced myself, I said, I've worked with the uh, National Safe Babies Court team. And I started with, I started out as a um, social worker in Kent County, Michigan in 1976. So the law was new, the practice was new. We didn't have theories, we didn't have tools. The only theory we had at that point to explain why parents hurt children 
was the war cycle. Those of you, Dr. Jones may remember this, Ray Helfer and the world of abnormal rearing, that was the only tool we had. Um, in terms of how do we understand what happens to African-American children in this system, um, Billingsley was the only, only thing, the only uh, written publication, and this was the strength of black families, and that was written in response to the Moynihan Report. What we still live in all these years later, um, as I work with uh, Safe Baby Court teams, as I work with individuals, as I teach the social work students, um, teach them content that we didn't have as a profession um, years and years ago. The reality is that we still live in a racially stratified society that's designed to privilege one group and to subjugate other groups, black and brown people. We can keep that in mind that this was not something that happened. Many times people will say, slavery happened all these years ago. What does it have to do with what I'm doing right now? I'm a clinician, I'm working with families and uh, you know, I, I've studied Freud, I've studied all the various theories around how do you help people individually. As a social work profession, I say that we have to um, we have to elevate those constructs and theories that have been part of the social work profession. Strengths of the person in environment, the strengths approach, HIPSI, human behavior in the social environment. One of the persons who introduced said it's a humanity that we have to get back to. Socioeconomic differences, inequities that are, are uh, caused by a number of different factors are all there, but they have their roots in a structural system that began in slavery. And as you heard, this structural racism, structural inequality, um, as you heard Ray and Joan go through the whole historical legacies, the origins of a system that's designed to support children and instead um, depresses them. The um, message that I want you to take away from in terms of the work that I do with Safe Baby Court Team is the idea that racial disparities, racial disproportionality, it hurts these babies. It hurts children. It hurts parents to be um, in foster care longer than any other group, to not have assessment tools, to not have the supports, to not have the services that other families have. I tell you a real brief story from my child welfare experiences. Um, I'll never forget that in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan in the 70s, African American families made up only 11% of the city. But of course, disproportionality, we, have, we had lots of black folks on our, our, our um, caseloads, and we only had two African American social workers. Thank God we had the National Association of Black Social Workers. But my point is that the white, well meaning white social workers who were investigating mainly neglect, those were, that was what the, um, the majority of uh, families reported for neglect to the system. They were asking questions about um, our peed bed asking me as an African-American, is P, our, our P mattresses, is that cultural? I didn't know the answer. I knew that wasn't true of my family, my African-American family, but my point is that we, I didn't have information to counter their stereotypes, their biases, the misinformation or the lack of training that they had. As Joan said at the beginning, there was no part in the curriculum about racism, about bias, about structural inequality in social work curricula at that time. So again, white children and white families as the model, this is the model that the social work practitioners that I work with. We have to focus on intent versus impact. Intentions, good intentions, social workers primarily have good intentions. I remember her name now, Greta Meniga, and I'll just say it for those of you on the call who may be from Grand Rapids, um, she's since retired, but my point is that she had good intentions in asking me, was this cultural or was this child abuse and neglect? I went back to graduate school to find out an answer to that question, if we could go to the next slide. Um, I found out an answer to that question. Now, research has, uh, the research that I do, builds on cultural strengths. The research that I do uh, says that we have to work collectively. We have to work in teams. We have to work in communities to begin to dismantle racism that 
permeates child welfare system. Good intentioned people, people, social workers who are typically dedicated to their work, they may not have the right culturally informed, culturally based tools to do that work. They may not recognize some of what you're gonna hear the rest of this symposium, how their own experiences may shape what happens to them. We need tools to help social work professionals, communities, parents, leverage the powers that they have in whatever space that they operate in. The work that I do in terms of my own specific research is on the hair combing task as a way to strengthen parent-child attachment. Everyday tasks that social workers can use to assess and intervene when there's trouble in the relationships. Use their power. Social workers can use their white privilege. Um, white social workers who come to me, who come to our various organizations, what can I do? What can I do? We can leverage we can leverage our privileges in ways that elevate, that shine a lens on the um, racist practices, policies, traditions that we don't even recognize because it hasn't been talked enough. I talked about enough. My appreciation with this, this symposium is that we're shining a lens. We're continuing a conversation. The National Association of Black Social Workers They've had this conversation since the mid 60s in terms of how black families have been treated in the system. They've worked for legislation. They've worked for policies that would rectify these um, inadequacies, this inadequ inadequacy, this invisibility. In a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must all be collective anti-racist activists in our professional practices, whether or not our role is educator, if it's a direct practitioner, if it's a support person, if it's a cost volunteer, if it's if it's simply to be with our own family so that we can raise children who are aware, who are ready to help from a systems point of view. General systems theory is a theory that um, permeates everything we do and we, we I do and we should do in terms of understanding how interdependence, how all of us can contribute to dismantling this racist structure. I want to end my comments with a, a quote from John Mibtiti. He's an African philosopher and um, he's an African philosopher. He says, and those of you may be familiar with him, I am because we are and because we are, I am. That's a collectivist type of approach we can take to begin to dismantle this system. I thank you all for your attention. We're gonna have uh, time for questions. I think right now um, the uh, moderator will let us know, will lead us. Thank you. I know it was really excellent to dovetail with the previous and a bridge to our next topic on juvenile justice. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on that really stuck, um, struck me was the unnamed norm that, um, that you were speaking about, the unnamed norm of whiteness that we, we really don't discuss enough in social work. You know, we talk about the other and we talk about disparities and we talk about um, racism, but we don't necessarily talk about what the normative construct is and what that looks like. And if we're measuring uh, families against an unnamed norm, um, until we name it, we're not going to be able to change that, right? Mm -hmm. So really appreciate that contribution. Um, the other uh, really key historical piece that your timeline brought out was the exclusion of Black children from foster care, the exclusion of Black children and families from child welfare, which has a deep parallel with juvenile justice facilities and the juvenile court uh, as a bridge to our next presenter. Um, we do have questions logged, and we're going to come back to you all at the end of the next presentation for our Q&A session. So we'll bring you back on um, after, uh, after our last paper. Thank you so much. Okay, so our next presenter in the last in this panel is Tanya Smith-Brice. 
Um, she will be talking about a paper on grown-ish female delinquency in black and white, 1890 to 1930. And Dr. Tanya Smith Bryce has most recently served as the Dean of the College of Professional Studies at Bowie State University in Maryland. Um, she's done a lot of work on um, structural violence in the African-American community. And I'm really excited to hear her presentation today. So thank you, welcome. Thank you, I'm very excited about being here today. All right, so we're gonna hope that this technology works out the way that we expect it to. Um, and so as Laura mentioned, uh, my presentation um, uh, sort of uh, is historical antecedent to the previous two presentations. And so you'll see a lot of that um, uh, uh, connection there. So let's get started. Early 20th century America reveals a tale of two societies, much like we just heard um, from the previous presentation. There was a black society and a white society. Um, although these societies were parallel in their structures, the white society appreciated more access to resources than the black society. Um, there were parallel educational systems, uh, child welfare systems, and juvenile justice systems. Uh, the system, uh, Sorry, uh, the system designed for blacks had fewer um, government and private fund expenditures, inferior physical facilities, and generally inadequate uh, resources. And I'm sorry, I'm getting a notice here that my computer's not plugged in. Um, despite these inadequacies, the survival needs of black climate clients were somehow met, albeit on a modest scale. This presentation examines a model for addressing female delinquency as an example of an early 20th century Black women's efforts to provide social services. Uh, these women's services were built on the principles of self-help, social uplift, and interracial cooperation, which were all essential components for navigating the social, economic, and political challenges that Blacks faced. During the early 1900s, gender, race, and class were critical factors in America's self-image, and they permeated societal values um, and behaviors. Historian and theorist Darlene Clark Hines reminds us that any discussion of race and gender must also be grounded in the complexities and realities of class exploitation and inequalities. In order for serious discussion of intersectionality to take place, class needs to be given as much attention as race and gender. Uh, this was particularly evident in perceptions and, um, and definitions of delinquency and in approaches to punishment, beneficence, and service design and delivery. Tice summarized this notion saying, the complexities of race, class, ethnicity, and power among women reformers shaped professional representation, the care relationship, and transformations in models of benevolent practice. This is especially evident in the work that Black women undertook as part of their mission to uplift the race. These women, the educated elite, reformers, and entrepreneurial activists worked strategically to confront a system of racial oppression that seemed impermeable. Black women were ready for the challenge, but they knew that they had to, quote unquote, first establish that their sexual natures were above reproach and that they were virtuous women deserving of respect. Make sure this is going okay. Victorian standards of morality governed the social norms for women in early 20th century America. Considered the fairer sex, women were expected to be chaste until marriage. Sexuality for women was to exist only in the context of marriage and procreation. And even then, it was considered a wifely duty. For women to desire sexual pleasure suggested some serious psychological problem or defect for which they were expected to receive professional help and or risk being cast out of society as deviants. The label of sexual delinquent seemed to have been reserved overwhelmingly for females. 
1916 study of 1,000 juvenile delinquent recidivists, researchers found that 60% to 73% of young females in this study were charged with sexual offenses as opposed to 4.5% of young males. It is noteworthy that there were, quote, infrequency of venereal disease among males coming before the juvenile court, unquote, and that, quote, young males are not brought before the court for sexual delinquency, unquote. On the other hand, the study noted that, quote, a large number of the females are thus diseased, unquote, which the researchers presented as evidence to support the harsh treatment of girls um, in the juvenile justice uh, system. That they were actually deserving of the judicial harshness because of their loathsome conduct. Girls were often charged with crimes of morality, such as vagrancy, beggary, stubbornness, deceitfulness, idle and vicious behavior, wanton and lewd conduct, and running away. That is, crimes which were seen as threatening to social and moral order and decency. Even young girls who were victims of abuse and neglect were treated as if they were culprits and were essentially blamed for their own victimization. Women were considered the standard bearers of morality. However, these Victorian standards of moral conduct were intended for white middle-class women. Black women were viewed by white society as innately promiscuous, as animal-like, and sexually unrestrained. Thus placing the onus of their sexual victimization on them rather on the perpetrators. These attitudes towards black women's sexuality made them vulnerable to sexual exploitation, particularly from white men who perceived black women as easy prey or who were fascinated by the myth of the black woman as an erotic icon. These black women and girls were constantly confronted with insults of sexual innuendos, requests, gropings, and rape with virtually no protection from the law. Local and regional policies and customs placed these girls in vulnerable and precarious situations. If they reported such offenses, they were identified as the provocateurs and risked being labeled sexual delinquents with subsequent punitive consequences. Historically, social class within the Black community and across racial lines has proved to be divisive and issues regarding female sexual delinquency were viewed as problems of the lower classes. Middle-class Blacks believe that social uplift and middle-class ideology were viable solutions to sexual delinquency among the lower classes. Mary Church Terrell, a prominent Black educator who enjoyed an upper-class lifestyle throughout her entire life, expressed a sentiment that many of her peers shared. Terrell said, even though we wish to shun them and hold ourselves entirely aloof from them, we cannot escape the consequences of their acts. So that if the call of duty were disregarded altogether, policy and self-preservation would demand that we go down among the lowly, the illiterate, and even the vicious, to whom we are bound by the ties of race and sex, and put forth every possible effort to uplift and reclaim them. Terrell's eloquent harangue suggests, seems to illustrate a philosophy of classes disdain that was, high, that was widely held by other upper and middle class Blacks. Historic, oops, sorry. On the other hand, some like settlement house workers um, Bertie Henrietta Haynes gravitated toward those whom Terrell called the lowly. She developed programs specifically for children labeled delinquent. Through these programs, she emphasized the children's rights to services and the social workers' responsibilities to serve them. Other reformers turned their attention to policy development and implementation. For example, bank president, Maggie Lena Walker's gubernatorial appointment to the Virginia Industrial School for Colored Girls Board gave her an opportunity to influence the social policy that affected delinquent girls across the state. Additionally, 
There were preventative strategies initiated to serve black girls, such as literacy, literary contests that club woman Elizabeth Ross Haynes developed for high school girls in New York and New Jersey. Although these approaches were noteworthy, large scale efforts to address issues of female delinquency in the black community were minimal. Homes for wayward young girls were established across the United States, particularly in the Northeast and in the Midwest. But rarely did any of these homes accept black girls. Consequently, young black girls deemed delinquent by policy and or practice were subject to the harshness of the penitentiary system. Black women and white women approached the delinquent girls' problems variously. Both groups of women identified sexual morality as a key characteristic of delinquency. However, white women believed that sexual offenses resulted from the overt or passive actions of the girl. They also believed that one's appearance was an important indicator of morality, as was documented in a social worker's case notes written sometime between 1926 and 1928, which reads, Hazel was admonished by the social worker for improper conduct, such as staying out late, going out with boys, or wearing overalls, a red shirt, and a red bandana, attire that would put her in the way of receiving insults from men. This quote further demonstrates the notion that girls themselves invited inappropriate sexual advances. Black women believed that sexual offenses were a result of social norms outside of the control of the young girl. One black woman said the following of these social norms. It is commonly said that no girl or woman receives a certain kind of insult unless she invites it. That does not apply to a colored girl and woman in the South. The color of her face alone is sufficient invitation to the Southern white man. Few colored girls reach the age of 16 without receiving advances from them maybe from a young upstart and often from a man old enough to be their father, a white haired veteran of sin. I have had a clerk in a store hold my hand as I give him the money for some purchase and utter some vile requests, a shoe man to take liberties, a man in a crowd to place his hands on my person, others to follow me to my very door, a school director to assure me a position if I did his bidding. Where the white girl has one temptation, mine will have many. Mine will have few opportunities and no protection. It does not matter how good or wise my children may be. They are colored. When I have said that, all is said. Everything is forgiven in the South. This statement describes a scenario and perspective that is in stark contrast to what white women experience, and it highlights Black women and girls' vulnerability to sexual aggression, along with their limited ability to rebuff such advances. Even though there were no unanimity as to the causes of sexual delinquency, there was clarity and agreement among, among black club women and reformers that adopting middle-class behavior and maintaining morality beyond reproach were the necessary initial problem-solving strategies. Ergo, teaching middle-class behavior within a racial caste system provided the foundation for, protecting, for protective work with these young women and girls. Black women's clubs were the first organized groups to target the problem of sexual delinquency among, these, among their girls and young women. The National Association of Colored Women, founded in 1896, formalized care for black females that provided education, middle-class role models, and a system of protection. And this group representing black women in 40 states was a reflection of the national trend of black women's groups that developed in response to growing social welfare concerns. This organization exemplified the theme of race uplift with the motto, lifting as we climb. This network of club women developed social welfare systems that operated parallel to the white segregated system and included an array of services and programs, including orphanages, old folks homes, kindergartens, homes for working girls, and other programs to respond to contemporary community needs. The North Carolina Federation of Negro Women, an affiliate of the National Association of Colored Women, uh, was instrumental in developing a system of protection for black girls 
through the founding of the North Carolina Industrial Home for Colored Girls in 1925, uh, which is also known as Eflind Home for Girls. The state of North Carolina would not establish and fully support an institution for delinquent black girls until 1943. Yet between 1919 and 1939, North Carolina's juvenile courts handled approximately 192 cases per year that involved black girls. These girls were placed on probation or returned to their communities without benefit of any form of vocational training and rehabilitation. For serious crimes other than moral crimes, black girls were sent to adult penitentiaries. A North Carolina judge and domestic relations court judge expressed frustration and dismay with the lack of services for black girls saying, in my work as judge of domestic relations court, which includes, um, I'm sorry. My hands are tied in dealing with delinquent Negro girls in the absence of my institution. I am convinced this encourages delinquency. And my time is going by quickly. So just to kind of go through this pretty quickly, since I only have about uh, four more minutes. Um, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, uh, was a, a leader of the North Carolina Federation of Negro Women who uh, developed this home for black girls who were considered delinquent. And this home served a role in which uh, it met the needs of uh, juvenile, uh, it, it met, met the needs of delinquency in the state of um, North Carolina, which the juvenile justice system formally refused to do so. So as I stated, most of these young women ended up in the penitentiary system, many of them as young as six years old. So when we look at uh, these uh, uh, Eflin home, we see that the way in which this work was done was through this concept of interracial cooperation between the black and white women of the state. For example, in 1891, the Hospital of Good Samaritan, a hospital built in Charlotte for Blacks, was as a result of this concept of interracial cooperation spearheaded by parallel organizations of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Interracial cooperation was not always easily achieved, especially with white women demanding, quote unquote, almost obsequious obedience from their Black counterparts. These black reformers nonetheless recognized that they could achieve more for their community if white women better understood their work and supported it on some level. So with more clarity about the black community and its needs, Gilmore wrote that white club women, quote, became less pliant in the hands of male politicians who attempted to manipulate them to further the gendered rhetoric of white supremacy. Brown understood that this phenomenon, Brown understood this phenomenon very well and cautiously, but persistently embraced white female leaders across the country. In a letter to the North Carolina Commissioner of Public Welfare, Brown, always solicitous and appealing to women's commonalities, wrote, as mothers and sisters, we want to save the young girls who are going astray. Eflin Home, also known as the North Carolina Industrial Home for Colored Girls, uh, was to be the institution to save these young girls. In October 1925, this facility was licensed and accepted its first inmate, which was the term that was used uh, to describe residents of various institutions during that time period. And I'm rushing through this pretty quickly. Um, so again, uh, the way in which this interracial cooperation worked is that the board of uh, Eflin Home uh, was made up of the governor's wife, who was a co-chair, along with the wife of a prominent uh, African-American um, uh, businessman. So the chairwoman of the board was Fannie Yarborough Bickett, who was a, an attorney, um, and the governor's wife. And the um, other co-chair was Minnie Summer Pearson, who was a leading uh, member of the club women's movement, but a very prominent businesswoman in her own right. And the board was made up of 12 additional women who were um, active members and leaders in their, own, in their own rights. But they were all from upper class families. These men, these women um, uh, work closely with folks in the communities who raise 
funds. They use nickel and dime campaigns in churches and other fraternal um, organizations among Black folks to uh, support the work of, uh, of saving our girls. Eflin Home had a positive impact on North Carolina's juvenile justice system and on other aspects of the state as well. The home served the state in two primary ways. It provided services to a neglected segment of the state's population, but it also saved the state money because the state didn't have to use their funds to support this neglected population. But just very quickly in my last couple of minutes here, um, one other big piece that the home um, engaged in some work was um, it protected these young girls from further uh, uh, sexual exploitation. At least that's what the women who led this organization believed. Um, they believed that if they could train these young girls to become uh, middle class, have middle class values, but also engage in that work that was uh, limited to Black women, which was around uh, domestic work and being in the homes of, of domestic, um, in the homes of white folks, that they believed that they would be able to uh, teach these young girls to behave in such a way um, that they would limit the possibility of them being um, protected from uh, sexual exploitation. But of course, we know that that did not uh, work as well as they expected it to work. Um, I am very thankful for this opportunity to share um, very quickly with you the work that was done by Black women um, to create a child welfare system in the state of North Carolina uh, that protected young girls, um, Black girls from um, sexual exploitation. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um... As, as you know, um, Dr. Bryce, I have a particular interest in this mm -hmm. topic. My very first publication was about um, the history of girls' delinquency and constructions of womanhood. And this is just um, a really amazing presentation. I love the pictures. I loved all the kind of unearthing of this history. Um, that isn't necessarily told. One of the things I was thinking about as you were talking was how black women, um, you know, in organizing services for black children because they were excluded from yes. other services, from the courts, from the reformatories, you know, in, in what ways were they, did they have to conform to notions of white womanhood um, in order to even have those services be funded or accepted. So right. that's a really interesting piece. Mm -hmm. um, and as I'm thinking back through the panels, if we had, if we had gone from yours the other way, um, this whole series could be from exclusion to over surveillance in some ways, yes. right? Yes. As we see the, the movement from the exclusion of black children and families from any services unless they were organized by the black community for the black community. Um, and then as after World War II, as the other panelists mentioned, we get into the over surveillance and That's then right. through the crack cocaine epidemic to today. Um, so thank you. I'm gonna bring invite all the presenters to come back on while we take some questions from the audience. Okay, so we will be getting some questions from um, from folks that submitted them through YouTube. And we'll see how this technology works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's working. All right. Um, so I think this question is for the first uh, the first group of panelists, for Jenny and Kristen from Bonnie Richardson. Um, please address or explain how mandatory reporting and that those laws disproportionately affects BIPOC families in negative ways. 
Is that BIPOC? Um, yes, Black and Indigenous people of color. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Just learned a new term. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think the overrepresentation of of um, and and I guess it's. I hope it's okay for me to say people of color. Uh, and I'm talking about all people of color. The overrepresentation of people of color of color is just uh, horrid. And those those mandatory reporting policies oftentimes only focus on uh, they have they're punitive in nature. There's the the reporting has nothing attached to it that says how can we best. Um, um, address this family and meet their needs. For example, a lot of times we get reports on, on folks of color around uh, the whole issue around trauma that comes up. Well, you know, that, that requires more than just a frontline worker. You know, there are a number of other uh, resources and people that have to be involved in that to address that issue. So I think if we really wanna, wanna tease out the disproportionality of all of that. We have there have to be retraining. There have to be um, the appropriate people at the table to address uh, the issue and not just put it all on the frontline worker. Can I say something too? I think that that this child welfare system is risk aversive, and so what happens is when a family becomes to the attention of child protection through mandatory reporting, um, because there's such risk, and I think, you know, rightly so, that many social workers have been accused of, you know, when, when children die um, because of, you know, they were uh, sent home too early or things happen. Um, I think that's what makes people risk aversive. And so this idea that we'd rather be safe than sorry, the problem mm -hmm. with that is that then that brings more families of color into the system because, you know, we want to be safe and we don't want, you know, anything, you know, harmful to happen to, to children. And so I think there is this issue that happens with child welfare around, you know, people of color particularly, is that it, we are so risk aversive and that we are trying to make sure that nothing happens, that anything, um, we begin to investigate anything and everything and it all comes into the system. And I think once children get into the system, it's really hard to get out. Absolutely. I would also like to add, um, because Dr. Dr. Jones and I, we were pulling some um, research from the 1980s and we actually saw some um, examples of what were considered to be child abuse. And these, these examples were so ambiguous um, and they also, not just ambiguous, but they also were very, um, they, they were very race, they were race specific. And so when you talk about understanding why we're disproportionately um, impacted by mandatory reporting is because there's a lack of understanding for the Black family experience and how that translates into parenting practices, whether that's practices of resiliency or those are practices of discipline. It's not seen from that perspective. And I think that when you're looking, when other people who are required to be ran mandated reporters, when they are reporting on Black families, they're doing it from their lens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think that that leads into what what I think is going to be our next question. Um, so hold that thought for a sec about the lens. Um, OK. I saw a question come up about Afrocentrism. So we're going to mm -hmm. come back to that when when it comes up. Um, so this is a question from Shay Davis. Che or Shay, I'm not sure. Uh, what prompted the first law in 1963 and who needs to be educated um, about changing the child welfare outcomes? Big questions, so. Um, yeah, and I think what she's asking about is the, the law that started in California, I believe, the child abuse reporting law. Well, this kind of goes way back to Henry Kempe uh, looking at the, uh, kids that come in with broken bones. And so that's why we we look at, that's why reporting was only um, required of doctors because when, you know, kids come into the hospital or come into the doctor's office with a broken bone, that's why doctors had to make those reports. And, and, I, and, 
I think the question is who needs to be educated to change these outcomes in child welfare? Well, you know, that's a big question. And I think there are lots of ways to do that. Uh, first of all, starting with child welfare, the, the people that work in the system, you know, we, we have to get trained, uh, credentialed social workers to do this work and not people who have, have a degree in some other field that comes into child welfare and, and do it for a little while because they don't understand the family systems. They don't understand the dynamics of this. They don't under, you know, they haven't been taught the value base of social work. And 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 it comes in, they come in oftentimes in, with this very punitive way. Because the idea of children being hurt is is just a horrid thing. So people automatically form their opinions about uh, the folks that that they believe hurt the kids or the perpetrators of these of these issues, and so as a society we think bad about them, and and many of those people in society come into that system and bring that value base, and and are don't know a lot about uh, people of color, and, and as Christian has talked about black families and their history and the historical trauma that's occurred, the same thing with historical trauma that's occurred with Native American families. And so people don't have that, don't have that when they come into this profession. So they operate by what's in front of them or what they have known over the years. And so that plays out in service plans, that plays out in uh, disproportionality, that plays out in overrepresentation. It plays out in all of those ways. So I think, I, I do think, I do think that because we are where we are in the world today, and we talked about COVID having transformed our lives in every aspect of what we do, this is an opportunity for us to rethink uh, how we can transform the child welfare system. Oh, because okay. life will never be the same as it once was. That's just a fact. Mm -hmm. And so we have to think about now, what can we do? How do we go about transforming that system. And I think it can start with our students in the classroom, uh, but but training of people that's in the system. And I'm not talking about that that required mandatory training that they go through when they first come in and get the job. I'm talking about ongoing uh, training that can help people really understand the needs of the families that they work with. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, um, I'd like to add, oh, oh sure, Tanya, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, Kristen. Go ahead, Kristen. Go okay. ahead, Tanya. Go ahead, Tanya. I was just going to say, I'd like to add to that, that um, um, as you all have just um, responded so well, um, it is about the lens through which you see people, which the way we, you see humans. And so uh, there, there are several questions about um, Afrocentrism and African-centered approaches, mm -hmm. um, which are ways in which you see folks in their full humanity. Mm -hmm. And so training has to be uh, about one's internal biases um, and being able to recognize that, but also to look to other ways of being. And so as Sister Marva mentioned in, when she was speaking about uh, the work that, uh, for instance, the National Association of Black Social Workers have been doing since its inception, which was really the reason why it started, was about um, the ways in which folks were doing harm uh, in the Black community um, because they were using a, an oppressive lens through which to see us. And so um, there are great theoreticians, and I don't know if that's a question that's gonna come up, so I might just wait. Um, but the, I, I do have some responses to um, who were some people to look to, to kind of get a lens um, and to get an idea um, a, about this. But I think it's your lens that's most important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just wanna, I just wanna add um, very briefly that I believe they asked, um, who do we need to train with child welfare? So as a social worker, my background is in psychology. I got a master's in social work and I'm now becoming a family scientist. What I realized is that on each level, everyone isn't talking to one another. There has to be some type of conversation where everybody is understanding. So I started a podcast, Black Family Scholar. On that oh. podcast, <laughs> I, um, I basically, it is being able to bridge the community, researchers, and practitioners together about Black family issues. And what that does is it allows us to be able to have a conversation where we're hitting on multiple levels and translate that research 
to the to the everyday person in everyday language. Because I think the, the fact is, is that there's a disconnect between researchers and practitioners and practitioners and families. Mm -hmm. So I, I just said, I think there needs to be a holistic approach when we're talking about being able to inform or educate people in, that have um, contact in the child welfare system. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Yeah. All right. We are going to go. This this is a continuation uh, for this question from any of the panelists, um, which is from Kristen McNeely. Uh, are there Afrocentric theories you would recommend to inform our practices? That's the first part of the question. Why don't we hear from um, Tanya, Marva, and then we'll we'll go from then and, and Jenny. All right. That's fine. That's fine. Cool. There we go. So just very, very quickly, yes, there's a whole list of folks, starting with as Marva raised, Andrew Billingsley, Robert Hill, yes. um, Barbara Solomon, yes. um, uh, mm -hmm. even uh, Iris Carlton Lene. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact. There is a book chapter that just came out uh, through the work that Kansas, University of Kansas um, was celebrating, um, that uh, book chapter that was done by me and Dr. Denise McLean Davison called The Strength of Black Families, The Elusive Ties of Perspective and Praxis in Social Work Education, where we actually lay out uh, some of those theorists and um, all the way from the way in which curriculum should be shaped to the way practice is informed, to the way in which we do research in Black communities. And so I absolutely would encourage you to get your hands on that online text and um, and be able to start uh, start there. But there are so many, I mean, yes. so many names. Yes, yes, yes. And I wanna just build on that, the, the point that uh, Tanya just made in terms of, there's a lot of buried work one of the um, um, outcomes of a structural system that's not designed to elevate you or highlight what you or targeted groups have is to, you know, who's telling the story? Our yes. research gets buried, our research gets marginalized, it doesn't get published in the peer-reviewed journals, or if it gets published, it gets buried under topics like um, only, I mean, these are important topics, but topics like poverty, and so mm -hmm. you find out later that the whole sample was African-American. You mm -hmm. find out later that the uh, communities were communities of color that were the focus of the research, but that's not mentioned in the title, it's not mentioned in the, in the abstract. I, I, wanna, I wanna elevate one name because this was a hero of mine and this was a person who shaped the work that I did. So again, in terms of Afrocentric theories, Harry McAdoo is, is one of my heroes as well as a person whose work her work with single African-American mothers in the DC area, in the yeah. educational system, it helped shape me and helped me understand how I could use a cultural lens to identify the strengths of black families as Billingsley helped us with. So again, I'd say the uh, sources, um, dissertations that were not published, but dissertations that are rich sources mm -hmm. of information in this age of internet, accessibility and online accessibility, there's a lot of original doc documents done by folks in the 60s, 70s, 50s, Kenneth Clark and Mamie Clark, the whole yes. the doll study that yes. helps us understand how African-American children who just simply are exposed to this inund inundated with these things. So again, there are uh, great resources I'm happy to share and I'm happy to read that chapter that you all have uh, mm -hmm. yeah. together too that reviews the chapter. Um, um, that's again, something that we can do collectively in the social work profession, uh, resources that can help um, elevate the African-American experience. And I'll just end by saying that at my school, at Whitney M. Young Junior School of Social Work at Clark Atlanta, uh, our pedagogical approach is the Afrocentric perspective. Uh, every student that comes into our school uh, is introduced to that perspective in their very first year. And it's woven throughout our um, <clears throat> curriculum, has been for years. It didn't come about when, when I came there. As a doc student there 20 years ago, uh, uh, when I came to school there is when I was really... Um, introduced to that in a way that made sense. 
And so it's a perspective that has I have carried with me throughout my my uh, career. And I too would be more than happy to share it with I can give um uh, I can Laura, I guess we can pass that information on to you. Yeah, yes, yes. and, and papers. Uh one of my faculty did a uh, and she presented this did a paper and presented it at CSWE uh, on the Afrocentric perspective and what it looks like in in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, some examples of, of um, a couple of classes that she had taught, and uh, we actually the the people in our uh, teaching and learning center actually use that as a model to help oh. other other faculty at school understand not just be able to talk about the perspective, but what does this look like in curriculum? Yes. yes. And just just a plug in, in May when we have our part four, we have a few papers accepted on Afrocentrism and Afrofuturism. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to, that's exciting. <laughs> I just have to add um, a theory that I found to be extremely helpful in my work as a family scientist. Um, I have been using Africana womanist. Dr. Clonora Wien Tussin. And I found that to be um, very grounding for my work because it allows me to look at the black man and the black woman yes. and the children together as a whole. And it and for me, for me, I'm looking at the family as a holistic unit, and that has guided my research. Um, when I found it, I was just like, oh, this is it. <laughs> like this is the one. But yes, Dr. Clonora Hudson Weems, Africana womanist. Womanism um, is a great resource. Um, and I, oh, I wanted to yes, add, right. oh, sorry, my computer. Okay. Um, so I, I'm in an interdisciplinary program and I really value the ability to bring in scholars who aren't even necessarily thinking about social work specifically, but who are thinking about like blackness and black, like I think sometimes social work can forget like all of the community organizing and all of these strengths that are happening like we are not the last line of defense against a lot of right. mm. <laughs> there are and there are so many ways of thinking about our mission of social justice and so i just want to plug a few um you know saidia hartman christina sharp portent spillers uh sylvia winter and afro pessimist theory which are all um, oh yeah thinking very much outside of what our task is, but I think when we can recenter the voices of people who are kind of fed up with our system or like very skeptical of social work, or very like not looking to us as sort of a, a, a way of liberation, it can help us recenter what we are trying to do here. You know, we are, um, okay, so. We are almost on schedule, which is wonderful. We are gonna, and I could talk to this panel all day. This is just a wealth of information and love it. Um, we have a question from Shimon Cohen, my friend out there, hi. Um, so I think everyone should chime in on this, is how do we, really, how do we stop engaging in these harmful practices we know more about the origins of exclusion and over surveillance and conflating public health issues with racism. Um, yeah, do you do you have kind of thoughts about um, how to stop this, Ray? You're yeah. You um, so I just want to push back a little on even the framing of the question. Mm -hmm. The problem is not individual so social workers doing individual. Yes. The problem is the Thank you, Ray. that is yeah. poorly designed. So yes. like like uh, a lot of what we're trying to say here is like these implicit bias trainings that we're doing are not going to work. Like these these sort of mm -hmm. small scale, like look into yourself and find internal racist, like, it, <laughs> like it, it's not going to do that. Like um, Dr. Blakey's work on um, mothers who are, um, part you know interacting with the child welfare system says like hey they're coming into this with a huge amount of trauma that we may have inflicted on them <sighs> in childhood no. so like how is any person in that system supposed to like you can't like your your job is these harmful practices and mm -hmm. so on mm -hmm. so re the restructuring has to come from a systemic lens and that sort of like yeah, yeah you, you know right you are so right because 
when you just listen to how people describe these families when they come into oh. when, you're, when you're looking at the referral of, I mean from day one you have automatically developed a negative impression you already see there's no hope with these people so because that's what you read into that very first referral your behavior is going to show that i mean you're not going to put a whole lot of energy in them because i can just i remember back in the day when when i'd hear my my colleagues who none of them were social workers i hear my colleagues talk about some of the families almost like they were not human you know, it's like they, they, they so there was never any yeah. win for them because yeah. you came to the process with these preconceived ideas about who they are, what their worth is, and and you um, imposing your values on them. So you never even get there. Mm -hmm. I also think that it can start in the classroom and being able to tell the narrative correctly and yeah. um, and being able to explicitly explicitly tell the stories of our families why our native why are our native individuals or our indigenous people excuse me why are indigenous people they suffer that way what historically has happened to them what has historically happened to the black family what has historically happened to hispanic families especially in the current climate that we're in right now mm -hmm. so it's, it starts in the classroom being able to teach from a perspective that is from the perspective of the subjugated and not the, not the perspective of those in power. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And, and this is Joan. I do agree with with Ray and, and, and Jenny and everything that we said about um, it's you know structural, but I do think that there are individual things that workers can do. And I remember being a worker myself. Um, and you know, one understanding our own history and making sure that I wasn't doing doing you know what others were doing with our families, but I made it a, a point to um, look for families. Um, if I knew that this child couldn't go home with this mom, then I then I made it my my mission to find a family member who could. I worked hard to engage the fathers um, who are often left out of this whole equation. And, and really bring them into this uh, a picture. I think that, you know, this idea of gatekeeping that, you know, sometimes we feel like this problem is so big that we can't do anything about it, but what can you do in your little sphere of, of influence and work to to try to change the narrative? I think that when my coworkers in, in when we're doing our, you know, case consultations would talk about families, then I would take the opportunity to educate and take the opportunity to, to shift the, the narrative. And so I do think that there's individual things that you can do, but I agree that this problem is systemic. And what we really tried to, to hone in on is that when the system was created, we were not even considered human. And so, you know, the system was not designed for us. And yet, um, you know, we are being impacted and affected by this system every single day. And so there really is a dis dismantling uh, that, that needs to happen yeah. of the system and a rebuilding. So um, I'm gonna, gonna close out our first session. Uh, very successful, I would add, in terms yes. of the panels fit together, the papers. I so glad that uh, and thankful to all the authors who worked quickly to prepare your presentations. Um, we learned a lot. There's a lot of questions we didn't get to, but hopefully we'll be able to post, or we will be posting all the videos later. We'll post um, contact information for all the authors. And I'd love to see us collect and publish, or at least send links of the readings that you mentioned, um, because we know that there isn't there's not going to be a one size uh, or a, a single solution to these systemic problems. What I'm hearing uh, in the last question is it's not just about, it's about changing the systems, understanding our history, reckoning with it, but also moving forward into policies and practices that value the humanity of black families and black children and all the clients that we have. So um, I'm very thankful to you. We're gonna have a break and then, sorry, we keep losing Marva. Um, and we'll be back at 12 o'clock PST.
with Social Work, Immigration and Displacement, which will be chaired by Dean Detlaff. Thank you all. And um, we'll see you in about 20 minutes. Bye bye.
Welcome back everyone to part one of our symposium on social work, white supremacy and racial justice. Part one of our symposium is focused on social work's historical legacy of racism and white supremacy. My name is Alan Detloff. I'm Dean of the Graduate College of Social Work at the University of Houston. And I'm very happy to be with all of you today and thank all of you for joining us. In our first panel today, you heard a lot about the history of racism that exists in our systems. Um, as Laura Abrams from UCLA said, from exclusion to over surveillance for black indigenous and people of color. And in particular, you heard about the racism that exists in what has historically been called the child welfare system, but is more accurately referred to as the family policing system. And as you heard in these presentations, that racism has existed since the very beginnings of that system and continues through today. In fact, as some of you said in the chat, the racism and the racial disparities that we see in the family policing system and other systems are actually evidence that the systems are working exactly as they were intended to work because those are systems that were created by white people for the purpose of maintaining the power and supremacy of white people. And as you've seen in the presentation so far, Social work has been complicit in that. Um, as a profession, we need to acknowledge that and figure out, are we going to continue to be part of the problem or are we going to do the work necessary as a profession so that we can be part of the solution? That in many ways is the reason we felt it was important to host this symposium. We have work to do as a profession before we can meaningfully be part of any solutions to the racism that currently exists in our society. We have to reckon with the racist origins of our profession and the racism that continues to exist in the systems where we currently practice. So now we're going to move on to our second panel and turn our attention to the role of social work in shaping discourses about immigrants and immigrant families and our role, our complicity in the separation and displacement of immigrant families. So we're going to begin with our first session or our first presentation from Dr. Yu Sun Park. Dr. Park is associate professor in the School of Social Work at Smith College and editor in chief of Affilia, the Journal of Women and Social Work. And she'll be presenting on Tracing Absent Critiques, Racism and White Supremacy in Social Work's Discourses of Immigration. Welcome, Dr. Park, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Um, there we go. Um, so I will be talking about uh, a lot of different things. And in thinking through what I could actually accomplish in 20 minutes, I really um, focused on three items. And I want to begin with this quote, um, that immigration control was a key institution through which the negotiation of whiteness occurred in our society. Not perhaps the key institution, but a really very important one. And I think that this is something that continues on today. So three things I would like to really cover today. And one is this, that the idea of um, whiteness, the construction of whiteness, and the racialization of population was forged in large part through our immigration policies and our practices. Um, and the second thing is a little difficult um, because absent critiques by definition is not there. But what I wanna show you is that there are things about immigration that social work was very much preoccupied with. And there are things about immigration and the construction of whiteness and the racialization of populations that we missed in, it, in its entirety, that we paid absolutely no heed to throughout our history. And thirdly, that that still continues today as well, that there are things that we should be talking about that we are not talking about. Um, and as Dean Detlef said, I think this is one of the reasons for why we're holding this symposium today. Um, so first I wanted to show you um, what the scientific knowledge is of the times was um, when the largest number of immigrants were coming. So this was um, in the early 19th, uh, I mean, late 19th century, early 20th century times. And this, these quotes are from um, the conference, the National Conference of Social Work, which ran until 1982, starting in 1875. And this was an anthropologist who was invited to give a talk. And he laid out what he thought was um, the problems of race in the US. And what I wanna point out is that they look remarkably similar to how we understand them today. So the major problems were the Negro, the Oriental, and in particular the Japanese, and more recently, the Jewish populations that were coming in from Eastern Europe. 
minor popul the minor problem of race um, were the influx of Italians, especially the Southern Italians, Greeks, Bohemians, and the Slavs, also Southern and Eastern Europeans who were coming in large numbers at the uh, turn of the century. And finally, um, the immigrant English, the French, the Germans, the Scandinavians, um, those who were called the Nordics, um, presented no problems whatsoever. And, and when I look at this, I think about um, what our current president has said about immigration. So I wanted to show you this as a, um, a way of showing that immigration policies um, were formulated around whatever the technologies, the science of the day was. Um, and this was how we understood race for the most part. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think we've moved all that far from this dynamic. There were two sets of um, exclusion criteria for immigration policies. Um, and this set, the individual exclusion or characterological exclusions that, um, uh, as I talk about, um, were really for European immigrants, white immigrants. And um, I'll just show you a, a, a list of them and they continue on and they grow. And what I'd like you to notice about them is that they're individual adjudications. These are the types of people um, and types of individuals that we were excluding. Quite different from this, um, and, and these are the kinds of uh, issues that social work um, of the day was very much um, concerned about. Um, there's a whole set of exclusions for a different population um, and what are categorical exclusions and what end up being racialized um, categorical exclusions that social work paid absolutely no attention to. And these are to do with um, exclusions that were targeting um, Asians. And, and why Asians? Because they were coming in large numbers as visible minorities. So beginning with the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which suspended the entry of Chinese laborers for about 10 years, um, they continue on um, to 1902, where uh, the act is extended indefinitely. And then the 1917 um, Asiatic Barred Zone Act, which creates, Congress creates this, uh, this notion of um, the Asiatic Barred Zone. So they draw a triangle on a map and say that all people who come from those areas are excluded. Um, this is where the term Asian Pacific Islanders come from. And then finally, in 1924, the Johnson-Reed Act permanently barred entry to any alien ineligible to citizenship. So I'm going to turn now to talk a little bit about that um, ineligibility to citizenship. So beginning with the Naturalization Act of 1790, um, and I really felt the need to cover this because in my teaching this material for over the years, I found that very few people actually know about this. The, um, this. the Act of 1790 established that the right to naturalization, to become a U.S. citizen through naturalization, was restricted to free white persons. Now, this became... Um, disputed in, in Supreme Court cases and lower court cases over and over and over. Um, and this is what I really actually mean. Um, this is the easiest way to see what that first quote means, that um, that whiteness was constructed and, and defined through immigration. So when was this, when did this end? Um, at different times for different populations. The right naturalization was extended to um, people of African and African descent in 1870 after the Civil War and 1924 for Native Americans, 1943 for people of Chinese descent and 46 for Filipino and Indian descent. And finally, it went off the books entirely um, only in 1952. Um, and I think this is... Uh, I mean, it's a long time on the one hand, but I feel like it is it is a very, very recent period. Um, so to understand that until 1952, certain people um, who came to the United States could not become U.S. citizens, not because of anything, but because of their racial identification or how they were seen. So first, I wanted to show you this case. Mr. Wong Kim Ark. Um, is a re really very important case because it took a Supreme Court case um, to establish that Asians, um, and in this case Chinese, and then it extended to other Asians, of course, um, 
if you were born on the soil, if you were a US born citizen, that you actually were a citizen, even if you were Chinese. So what happened with Mr. Wong Kim Ark was that he was born in California, went to China to go visit his parents and then came back to the United States and that went fine. He went again and on his second return was stopped at the border. So the case went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And for once, the, the Supreme Court justices declared that if you're a person who was born on U.S. soil, then you are a U.S. citizen. Um, and what the U.S. Uh, um, lawyers, um, the, the, the government lawyers argued was that because his parents were people who were ineligible to become U.S. citizens, being immigrants and not being born on the soil, that this person who was born on the soil could not actually have a different um, set of loyalties from his parents. So this was turned down. So um, the reason I point out, point this out in in part is because this right to to um, citizenship through birth on U.S. soil is challenged every year um, in in every Congress. And today the target is different. So today. Um, what the, the Republican senators and, and Congress people want to undo is citizenship for um, undocumented, to children of undocumented parents who were born on U.S. soil. So this keeps coming up as a challenge year after year after year. And then I want to show you this two cases that went up to Supreme Court that challenged um, and really defined what it means to be white in the United States. So remember, only free white persons could become um, U.S. citizens. So Mr. Takao Ozawa, 1922, the Supreme Court case argued was that Mr. Ozawa's lawyers argued that he was somebody who was should be considered um, a person of um, person who was white, because what whiteness meant was that someone was assimilatable, and he argued that he was assimilated. He his children didn't speak Japanese. They didn't eat Japanese food at home. Um, in in all all ways that you could think of, he performed as an American, thus white. That what the Supreme Court um, determined was that actually what white means is Caucasian. And nobody looking at Mr. Ozawa would actually argue that he was a white person because um, he was not Caucasian. And one of the interesting things that, that his lawyers did argue was that if whiteness means skin color, then in fact, Mr. Ozawa's skin color was whiter than most people's um, sitting in that courtroom. So it got struck down and he was denied citizenship rights. Three months later, um, the same set of justices argued this case, um, the case of Mr. Bhagat Singh Tind. Um, and what they, what Mr. Bhagat Singh Tind argued was that he was born in Punjab and came to the U.S. in 1913. And he was uh, working through the University of California system. Um, and he served in the army and was honorably discharged after serving in World War I. And the argument for himself was that he was actually Caucasian because any anthropologist and any linguist would argue that um, Caucasians came from the region of Mount Caucasus um, and that uh, people of high, uh, high caste Hindus from India, um, Brahmins, um, were actually people of Aryan descent who spoke an Indo-Aryan language. So the same set of justices who argued that Mr. Ozawa could not be a U.S. citizen because he was not Caucasian, then turned around and said, well, actually, we don't really care that um, you can establish your lineage all the way back to the region of Mount Caucasus, because what Caucasian means in actuality um, is a, a common sense term. So if Mr. Tind walked down the street and asked 10 people if he was Caucasian, um, nobody would actually argue that he was. Thus, his case was denied. And I want to point out the, the flexibility of this term, um, whiteness. And, and the courts were deciding one way and then immediately turning around and, and doing it a different way. Um, and in case you don't, you've never heard of um, Blumenbach's skull, I wanted to show you the skull. So Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who was um, a biologist, actually invented the term Caucasian. 
And so please look it up if you've never heard of him. And so this quote um, is from uh, one of the books that he wrote. And he says, I've taken the name of the variety from the region of Mount Caucasus, both because um, the, the area is beautiful, but also because all physiological reasons converge to this, that in this region, anywhere, um, was where the, the, the um, where huma humanity began. And also because these were the most beautiful skulls. So Caucasianness is actually, um, and quite um, definitively an invention. Um, so we talk about race as a social construct, but I think we need to understand that um, that, that is not a metaphor of any kind, right? And so the Ozawa tin cases worked out like this. The determination in Ozawa's case, the determination that the words white persons are synonymous with the words um, a person of the Caucasian race, um, was what was applied and that Mr. Ozawa was clearly not Caucasian. And three months later, in Mr. Tin's case, the mere ability to establish a line of descent from a Caucasian ancestor did not count because Caucasian was a conventional word of much flexibility. And that's a quote from the, the court. Um, and the free white persons are words of common speech um, that uh, can only apply to Caucasian as po um, popularly understood. So, oh, many, many, many cases like this came up to the Supreme Court, and this is how um, what whiteness is got determined. And it goes from skin color to um, the region of the world to many different ideas. But what's important for us to remember, I think, is that the flexibility of it. Um, the courts were willing to to change the definition and change how you actually counted the evidence for the definition, depending on who it wanted to keep out. And one of the things that never happens, no, no person who actually came up to the court actually um, argued that Caucasianness um, and whiteness um, should not be considered a reasonable way to determine citizenship. Everyone who came up argued that they should be, Mr. Ozawa argued that he should be considered Caucasian, Mr. Tin argued that he should be considered Caucasian, right? So they weren't actually trying to get rid of that box, but arguing to be included in the box. And I think it's worth um, thinking about why that is. Um, and the fact that if you remember that in 1870, um, Congress actually included people of African and African descent into this body of people who could become naturalized, nobody argued that they should be. So another way to argue for citizenship was not to argue for whiteness, but blackness, but nobody did. And let's actually think about why that was also the case. So to move on, what the greatest fear at the time about immigration, I think, in my view, was um, the fear of racial amalgamation, um, race mixture. And I wanted to show you this one quote from um, a social work article um, in 1925. And I can find you many, many, many examples from different years and, and different journals. Um, and what it says is no matter how completely um, people might become assimilated, economically, culturally, they would still be distinguished physically, racially. And that distinction being hereditary, um, race is a hereditary uh, inheritance, would last forever unless diluted by intermarriage. To admit mass immigration, therefore, from countries that we think of as racially inferior would be to load our grandchildren with the problem of choosing whether to amalgamate two races biologically. So this kind of a blunder and uh, would be a problem forever, right? So, and this was a relatively common idea within social work. Um, so, I wanna turn to this. Um, this is the cover of a book I wrote on the complicity of social workers in the forced removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. Um, because this is an exemplar of how that kind of thinking that was racialized um, and the racialization of Japanese Americans, um, Asian Americans, and certain kinds of populations um, played out in, in, um, during World War II. And so what was considered the greatest planned and controlled migration history uh, was a forced removal from coastal regions, um, Washington, Oregon, and um, California, of, of, of the entire population of Japanese Americans. And, sorry, um, approximately 120,000, which uh, just about covered the entire population of Japanese Americans at the time, were incarcerated in concentration camps 
um, run by the federal government. And two thirds who were, uh, of the people who were incarcerated were US born citizens. In 15, um, first in 15 civilian assembly centers and relocation centers. And I wanted to just tell you that this was, a lot of people argued for lots of different reasons why this should or should not happen. But what's really absolutely clear was that this was a matter of racism. So here's a quote from um, the United States Army who actually ran the removal. And what it says is that in the war in which we are now engaged, racial affinities are not severed by migration. Um, and I'd like you to note the similarity of this statement from that other statement that I just showed you. The Japanese race is an enemy race. And while many second and third generation Japanese born on United States soil, um, possessed of citizenship and Americanized, assimilated, the racial strains are undiluted. So the, the, what the army was arguing was that the Japanese were by definition disloyal and needed to be locked up because racially they were disloyal. Um, and this was a quote from a senator, a California senator, who, who said that we must preserve the soil for the Caucasian race. And that was another reason. Um, I think this was the real reason, actually, the, the financial reasons um, for removing the Japanese Americans. So I just want to show you um, a bunch of photos from this. But I want to point out that social workers were involved in absolutely every part of this process. And so these people are waiting in line to go and get registered to be removed. And this is a photograph from San Francisco. And they're waiting to actually go in and, and be interviewed by social workers. Every single person who was locked up was interviewed and tagged by a social worker. Did we protest? No, we did not as, as a profession. Here's another photo of um, people being removed. And these are the kinds of places where people were housed. And I think you were probably familiar with these photos. Um, this is one of the, the, the long-term internment camps, um, what are called internment camps popularly, but what are actually concentration camps and relocation camps in, in uh, terminology. So at the end of all this, um, here's a quote from a social worker who was involved in these processes. And what social workers really thought was that um, if they didn't get involved in doing this, there were social workers on every in every camp um, processing every part of this uh, removal, incarceration, and then resettlement process. And Perry Sundquist, who was a, um, a California um, social worker, um, a supervisor, um, he argued that the use of trained social workers enabled a difficult job to be done as decently as possible. So what he was arguing was that, and what a lot of social workers argued was that if we didn't do it, somebody else would have done it. And we tried to do um, the work that had to be done as decently as possible. And what I perseverate on is that nobody actually worked to expand the notion of what was decent at the time. Um, Nobody complained about doing this work. Nobody actually said, perhaps we should question our ability, um, our, our need to do this and get involved. Um, this, the cultural critic Robert Young says that the interval that we assert between ourselves and the past, um, where we are now in, in our thinking, in our, in our, in our activities, um, and what we did in the past, and a sort of a shameful past, right, maybe much less than we assume. And I think this is something we really need to remember. Um, so I will end with this photo. Um, this is what the one photo is a, a, a young Japanese boy who um, wears the the luggage tag that a social worker has put on him. Um, you see the luggage tags in the back as well. Um, and this is a photo from um, the border, the US-Mexico border today. I think what we are doing today um, is not so far removed from what we have done in the past. And although I'm just a minute over, um, I just wanna tell you that last year um, in JAMA, the, the journal, um, three, MDs put out an article asking, given our Hippocratic oath, can we be working in detention camps at the border? Um, and what really struck me was that these were MDs writing this and, and asking this question, and that we as a profession in social work have yet to ask this question, should we be participating? And I will end there. Thank you.
Thank you, Yu Sun. That was really a fascinating presentation. I really appreciate you being with us and presenting that today. I think you know you, you started the presentation and ended it with such fascinating concepts from the very beginning with this idea of immigration control being an institution that's so, so closely tied to the construction of whiteness is something that I don't think we talk about enough. Um, in, in, our, in our social work classes or in just the discourse about immigration. Um, and then I think the way you ended the presentation um, with the quote, which I wrote down, the use of trained social workers enabled the difficult job to be done as decently as possible. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's so relevant today, um, as you mentioned at detention centers, um, I think there's many social workers who are working in systems that we know cause harm to people. Yeah. And we we justify that or explain it because we're able to help the people in that systems or provide some kind of counter to mm -hmm. the harm that's being done. But but I really think there, there needs to come a point where we really question that and say, can we continue to work in these systems that we know cause harm or, or do we just need to get out Mm -hmm. separate ourselves completely from those systems. So I really appreciate the presentation. I know it has led to a lot of really great questions in the chat. Um, for all those of you who are watching, um, we will take your questions at the end of this presentation after we hear from our next two presenters. Before you leave, you send, I want to remind people of your book because it's exceptional and I hope everyone will read it. The title of your book is Facilitating Injustice, the Complicity of Social Workers in the Forced Removal and Incarceration of Japanese Americans. Thank you again for being with us today. And now for our second presentation, I'd like to welcome Benjamin Roth, who is Associate Professor at the University of South Carolina College of Social Work. And Benjamin is going to be presenting a session titled From Problem to Mass Repatriation, Social Work Discourse on Mexican Immigrants from 1917 to 1933. Thank you, Ben, for being with us today. Thank you, Alan. And I appreciate all the work that uh, has gone into planning this. Um, I think it's fitting that I'm following Houston's Park presentation. Uh, my topic, um, as you can see from the title, has to do as well with the complicity of the social work profession in the mass removal of, of Mexican Americans and Mexican immigrants, um, primarily in the 1920s and early 1930s during the Depression. Um, before going on, I would say that um, that this is uh, this is I'm I'm white. I am not Latino. I'm not an immigrant. And, and I would say that this work has been really important for me personally, just to be spending time um, going back and looking at historically um, the way that the, the social work profession had responded to, um, to what was termed back then, literally the, the Mexican problem. And, and I would say echoing what Yusin said, um, I think this is, this is an important exercise for all of us to do. Um, as I tell my students, um, and I'm, I'm sure other people have heard um, in my policy classes, when you um, when you look at current social problems, um, just like um, when you go to the doctor, um, they do a they ask you historically, is there a history of heart disease in your family? Um, if you're experiencing heart pain, right? Similarly, as a profession, I think we need to look historically. We need to look back because to the extent that we are missing. Um, that we have blinders on to um, current um, ways in which we are um, racializing or overlooking injustices within the immigration system. I think these have um, have strong connections to to how we have, as a profession, historically um, missed in these ways. Um, so I'm going to be reading from um, uh, part of the paper that we, I wrote for this conference and. And let me start um, by just explaining part of the reason why the, the 1920s are so interesting um, is because this was a critical period for Mex Mexican origin residents in the United States. Um, at the time, Mexican origin um, residents represented a growing share of the US population. They tended to concentrate in the Southwest and Texas, but were settling in greater numbers across the country in cities like Chicago. Um, the 1920s was also an era of highly restrictive anti-immigrant policies. We saw some of those in the slides that Yusin just showed. Um, and popular discourse at the time described this Mexican problem as a drain on society and a liability for the social, cultural, and economic health of the US. The intensity of this national antipathy towards Mexicans really came to a head um, in, in the, the next decade with the, um, the mass repatri repatriation of Mexican origin groups um, in the United States. Um, 
So in 1930, there were an estimated 1.65 million Mexican or origin residents in the U.S. And in the wake of the Great Depression, an estimated 1 million, many of them U.S. citizens, were forcibly returned to Mexico or encouraged to voluntarily repatriate. So critical scholarship has advanced understanding of how social workers socially constructed European immigrants as undeserving in the early 1900s. And, and we have a lot of credit to give a lot of credit to Yusun for her work on this and, and other things that she's published. Um, but we know less about how the young social work profession framed the worthiness of Mexicans during that time period. So um, what I wanna to talk to you about today is, um, is how the, um, the way that the uh, social work profession racialized Mexican origin residents at that time um, positioned them as a, um, as a profession to either actively engage and participate in the forced repatriation of Mexicans, or in many cases, um, to essentially turn a blind eye to it. Um, so th I think in the same way that um, Yusin said her, her remarks had relevance, I mean, I think it's obvious um, what the relevance of this historical moment has for, for us today. Um, these parallels include how immigrants today represent, re immigrants represented a similar share of the U.S. population in the 1920s as they do today. Um, inequality then was high as it is now. The national debate over immigration um, was, was as strong, if not stronger than it was, than it is today. Um, and as other, others have argued, this exercise of analyzing historical dis discourse provides a cautionary tale of how we as a profession um, need to be thinking about um, and actively approaching questions um, related to advancing immigrant rights today. A few quotes um, to get us started. One is from the US Commission on Civil Rights, um, which says, spurred by the economic distress of the Great Depression, federal immigration officials expelled hundreds of thousands of persons of Mexican descent from this country through increased border patrol raids and other immigration law enforcement techniques. Um, so this is in 1980, and the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights essentially said we um, we called this repatriation, but but really um, this was um, this was more that we called this a mass expulsion, but this was really um, um, a mass deportation. And um, according to Maynai, who has written Impossible Subjects, she's a historian, and and her book is. Um, is a critical work in this field. Nearly 20% of the Mexican population in the United States returned to Mexico during the early years of the Depression. The repatriation of Mexicans was a racial expulsion program exceeded in scale only by the Native American Indian removals of the 19th century. So we clearly can't dismiss um, the fact that that race intersects here with the justification for the mass expulsion of, um, of Mexicans during this time period. And of course, um, this now famous quote um, from, um, from Donald Trump in 2015, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems and they're bringing those problems with them, is what he says. So um, similar to, um, to Yusen's work, the material from my project comes from um, the proceedings of the National Conference of Social Work in the 1920s along with um, a, a magazine called The Survey, which was um, a, uh, a magazine that, that addressed social and political issues during that period. They also look at government reports and other academic publications. And, and I just wanna say um, at the front end that at this conference are not just social workers who are presenting. Um, and so one can argue that it's not fair to look at what's discussed here and say that this um, is a justifiable link then to claims that the social work profession was implicit in, um, in, in, in some of this work. Um, but in fact, um, as I'm going to show you some of the, we, we have some information to suggest that they are, first of all, um, but also that at this conference are leaders of the profession. Um, and this is where conversations were happening around these topics, um, big topics, I think, as we saw from, um, from the, the previous presentation, um, think, Social workers were debating how to respond as a profession to these emerging issues. So um, despite the work by Jane Addams and other reformers during this time um, to ameliorate, ameliorate deplorable work and living conditions experienced by immigrants in the 1900s, um, many other immigrants were viewed as, um, as problems. 
Um, even social work leaders such as Adams used language that pathologized immigrants and contributed, contributed to negative stereotypes of the neighborhoods where they lived. Um, in effect, while social workers were concerned with the well-being of immigrants, their discourse at times reified the popular nativist view that immigrants were a social, political, and cultural threat. Um, we see this in, um, in the way that, um, that, that some of the cartoons of this time um, portrayed the, the, the literacy test, for example. Um, this was when, in the 1920s, we have a range of federal immigration um, uh, categories that were being created to winnow out what were called undesirable immigrants. Um, they were constructed from the belief that some were incapable of being productive citizens, um, including based on skin, based on their race, as we heard just a moment ago, um, or others uh, were likely to become public charges depending on the local charities. These categories were constructed according to theories of racial superiority and informed by social Darwinism and the eugenics movement. Restrictionists at the time developed new policy tools as a pretext for exclusion, including the literacy test and annual quota system. The 1924 Johnson-Reed Act, as Yusin just described, restricted immigration from each country based on a quota system. Uh, but these quotas didn't apply to Mexico initially or other countries in the Western Hemisphere. Um, yet they did start to slow immigration from um, Southern, Eastern, and Central Europe. Um, and this then created a gap in the low-skilled labor force that Mexican origin residents began to fill. In the early 1900s, the majority of Mexicans in the U.S. were seasoned migrants, seasonal migrants, uh, spurred by growers and industrialists and facilitated by the U.S. Department of Labor's flexible enforcement of immigration laws at the U.S. border. Uh, Mexican migration increased dramatically in the 1920s, and the Mexican, settlement, um, Mex Mexican settlements fanned out across the country as never before. Mexican migrants who had previously worked seasonal agricultural jobs in California now found more permanent work in the steel industry in areas such as Chicago. Mexican migration increased to 20% of all admitted immigrants by 1927, and by 1930, about 10% about of the Mexican population had relocated to the U.S. Most Mexicans at the time lived in the Southwest, particularly in Texas, and this map um, of, of based on 1930 census data gives you a, a sense of where um, Mexican settlements were concentrating. Um, you can see there that uh, the Southwest was, was primarily um, home to, um, to Mexican origin residents, and, um, and this is for some obvious reasons. Not all Mexican origin residents there were immigrants, for example. Um, New Mexico's Spanish-speaking population dates back to the 17th century, and of course tens of thousands of Mexicans who remained in the region acquired by the United States in the 1848 Treaty of Guadalupe automatically became U.S. citizens. Um, so I'm not the recession of 1921 was the first time that Americans beyond the Southwest, however, began to doubt whether Mexican laborers were an asset, calling into question the relatively unrestricted, um, uh, un the relatively unrestricted nature of immigration from Mexico um, prior to that time. A sought-after labor resource during World War I, uh, Mexican immigrants during the recession were now more widely um, seen as a threat to white and black laborers trying to survive the economic crisis. Um, this contributed to what was called the Mexican problem at the time, just as the profession was turning more exclusively to individual case management as its signature technique, the fault lines of worthy versus unworthy were being determined for Mexican origin U.S. residents. These fault lines would become the basis uh, for a massive state-sponsored repatriation um, effort a decade later. A circuit court in Western Texas decided in 1897 that Mexicans were white for the purposes of naturalization laws. Until this point, the quote, scientific approach to race hadn't determined whether Mexicans should be categorized as white or of African descent. The court's decision was largely guided by the Treaty of Guadalupe in 1848, which granted U.S. citizenship to Mexicans in the new incorporated territories. Now, supposedly, they were white by law. However, Mexicans remained racialized subjects who were constructed um, as racially and morally inferior. Um, and this is something that um, we see uh, show up very clearly in some of the uh, presentations at the national conferences. Um, so Kerry Wick Williams, an author who wrote extensively about California politics and culture in his 1949 book, North from Mexico, asserted that the, the Mexican problem of the 1920s and 30s was, quote, deeply colored by the social work approach. 
particularly with the passage of the 1924 Immigration Act. Mexican immigrants became the new target for Americanization now that European immigrants had ground to a halt, immigration had ground to a halt. So um, McWilliams states, the whole apparatus of immigrant aid social work with its morose preoccupation with consequences rather than causes was thereupon transferred to Mexican immigration. The data that social workers collected, he says, was consistently interpreted in terms of what it revealed about the inadequacies and weaknesses of the Mexican character. The data proved that Mexican leaders or Mexicans lacked leadership, discipline, and organization, that they segregated themselves, and that they were lacking in thrift and enterprise. These are damning words of, um, the, of social workers at the time. And on the screen here, you can see um, a an excerpt from a presentation by um, Don Lascolier of the uh, University of Wisconsin, um, who stated that uh, there is a sufficient burden of evidence indicating the Mexicans' inferiority at present to justify us in checking Mexican immigration by appropriate legislation until we have studied more carefully their capacity, quote, to become real Americans. Comments by other authors uh, at the national meetings suggest that these views were common among social workers, and um, you can see them all over the place in the 1920s. Um, Las Collier specifically set, said social workers, quote, almost universally agree that Mexicans were ill-suited to become US citizens. Social workers in this period were particularly concerned about the problem of welfare dependency, so this framing of Mexicans isn't surprising. However, racializing Mexicans as non-white and framing them as unworthy of assistance in the late 1920s made it easier for social workers to ignore, I argue, or even help facilitate the period of forced repatriation when it began. I wanna point out that at these conferences, it wasn't, um, there were other voices that were um, providing alternative perspectives for social workers and social work leaders at the time. One of them was Ernesto Galarza, uh, who spoke at the 1929 conference uh, in a section on Mexican immigrants. Uh, by this time, the implementation of the 1924 quotas had finally arrived and the border patrol was, was five years old. It was uh, created under that 1924 law. Galarza was a labor organizer and eventual member, a mentor to Cesar Chavez. The debate that had waged for five years over how to implement the quotas now included the, the question of Mexican immigrants. Um, in fact, quote, bills proposing a quota for Western Hemisphere immigrants were introduced every year from 1926 to 1930. That is, this was um, certainly something that, uh, that social workers were very aware of as uh, a steady drumbeat um, following the 1924 quota law aimed to hold uh, Mexicans accountable for this too. Galarza at age 24 and only at the start of a long and influential career as an activist and organizer sought to dispel misguided notions about Mexican immigrants that distorted social workers' understandings of the Mexican problem. He called for social workers to return to structural explanations for inequality and to, char and to change their discriminatory views of Mexican immigrants. He stated that the children of Mexican immigrants were the victims of persistent racial prejudice who denationalized as Mexicans and stripped of their native tongue were trapped in difficult in a difficult borderland, he said. Voices other than Galarza's apparently spoke out against a restrictionist paradigm during this same meeting. We can see that in some of the accounts provided in the survey that um, that magazine that every year provided a, a kind of a summary, a short some shorthand summary of the, of the proceedings. Um, but several months later, after Galarza spoke, that's when the stock market crashed. And really the debate between restrictionist and expansionist to the extent that it really showed up in heated ways in the 1929 meeting at all, this uh, debate was abruptly forgotten as the forced removal of Mexican immigrants began in earnest. Um, and I wanna point out that the moment to challenge uh, these prevailing stereotypes of Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans at the social work national conferences, to the extent that this ever really occurred, um, it now proved to be too little too late. Um, because the repatriation was um, soon well underway. The repatriation of Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans included voluntary departures, formal deportations by the, by the Immigration and Naturalization Service, and organized efforts by local welfare offices. The annual report of the Commissioner General of Immigration states that deportations of Mexicans were scaled up significantly beginning in February 1931. Immigrants who had fallen into distress or who needed, quote, public aid within three years of their entry were prioritized, easing the strain on welfare organizations burdened with the support of these unemployed and destitute aliens. The commissioner reported that all national origin groups decreased in number the previous year. 
but the Mexican population experienced the most dramatic loss. In the early years of the depression, nearly 20% of the Mexican population in the US was repatriated. State laws sometimes enlisted social workers to assist with this immigration enforcement. In the spring of 1933, the, wealth, the New York State Legislature adopted a law allowing the state's Department of Social Welfare to remove any immigrant, even against his will, who was cared for by uh, the expense of state or county officials. Similarly, Pennsylvania enacted a law that prevented any officer or employee of the state, including social workers, to give financial support to an immigrant unless they could prove they legally entered the country. Laws that sound alarmingly familiar as we consider those such as Arizona's SB 1070 of 2010. When the Great Depression hit, welfare department administrative heads determined that approaching Mexican families on the dole to encourage them to voluntarily repatriate would relieve some of the pressure on overburdened relief roles. Welfare administrators across the country were under pressure to provide more relief to a greater number of people. In Michigan, repatriation was unquestionably viewed as part of the answer. It's obvious that any reduction in the relief load effective through repatriation services will be an effective, a significant factor toward the solution, says one report in 1941. But a review of case notes from that period suggested that in the carrying out of the program, the repatriation program, untrained caseworkers exerted undue pressures in some instances and others actually violated clients' rights. Other resources suggest that the public welfare offices in other cities and states performed a similar role in Gary, Indiana, various groups collaborated in raising funds to cover transportation costs for Mexican families for repatriation. Local settlement houses also financially contributed to the effort, but the pace of repatriating Mexicans from the region really picked up when the public assistance offices in Calumet Township, which is there in Gary, announced a plan to transport all of the unemployed Mexicans in that city back to Mexico. If social workers across the country were, in, were aiding the repatriation effort, Evidence of the, their complicity is most, oops. Evidence of their complicity um, is uh, most irrefutable in the case of Los Angeles. Um, the 1931 report from the Commissioner General of Immigration consistently pointed to the role of charitable organizations in facilitating the forced removal of Mexicans, stating that the departures of Mexicans had, quote, reached large proportions and that, quote, communities in the far west and southwest have aided in this repatriation to relieve their charity burdens. The following year's report was even more graphic, but now seemed to suggest that the assistance of charitable organizations was not unique to the southwest. When repatriation was discussed at the national meeting in the, 19, in, in the 1920s and the early 30s, late 1920s and early 30s, it was in reference to the deportation of European immigrants, not Mexicans. George Warren, the director of the American Branch International Migration Service in New York, exhorted social workers to adopt a sympathetic view of deportations. He calls social workers who are, quote, sensitive to the social considerations surrounding this migration to recognize the shattered hopes and atmosphere of defeat and despair. Um, and yet deportations uh, create intangible, immeasurable losses, he explains, disrupting families and family life. According to Warren, and this is in 1931, a social work perspective should see each deportation case in light of its effects on the larger family system. Forced removals of adults often impact children, some of whom are themselves US citizens. Yet according to Warren, rather than understanding the impact of deportation on families and children, some relief agencies were actually facilitating those deportations by helping to fund the return trip. What's important to note here is that Warren never mentions Mexicans, that his, uh, his his statement on the importance of social workers to attend to the negative impact of these forced deportations is always in reference to those Southern and Eastern Europeans who were, um, who were also deported during this time period. Ernesto Galarza um, in 1931, he was the same one who spoke up in defense of Mexican immigrants at the meeting in 1927, wrote in the survey um, that Mexicans in the US don't have anyone in their corner, including social workers. He says, lastly, the Mexican would look to the social worker. And this is during the time of forced repatriation. And here he finds someone of, of comfort, but no permanent aid. The social worker says by the immigrant, the social worker stays by the immigrant, grits her teeth and like her charge wonders. That is um, in Galarza's perspective, not all social workers were actively supporting the removal of Mexicans during this period, but neither were they collectively engaging um, engaged in challenging the deportation campaign. Many, it seems, did not see what was happening at all. 
So in conclusion, the way social workers framed the Mexican problem in the 1920s clouded their ability to see Mexican origin residents as fellow citizens. Numerous presenters at the national meetings aimed to humanize them, primarily by offering descriptive if critical assessments of their culture. But they often did so by highlighting differences that through a scientific lens, informed eugenics only served to brighten social boundaries, racialize, racializing Mexicans as non-white and alienating them as a group unfit for formal membership in US society. There was no single person or law that was independently responsible for the mass repatriation of hundreds of thousands of Mexican origin residents during the Great Depression. Many were uh, deported as a result of provisions within the 1924 immigration law, including the creation of the border patrol and the criminalizing of entering the country without inspection. But there was no presidential order or federal law um, specifically targeting Mexicans. This is possibly one reason why it goes largely overlooked by the social work profession at the time. And another, <clears throat> and another way that the period is similar to our own. The amount of laws, policies, initiatives, executive orders, and proclamations on immigration at the federal, state, and local level today make it nearly impossible for social workers to stay abreast of how our present enforcement machine is systematically removing and terrorizing immigrant communities across the country. These characteristics of immigration enforcement in the 1920s sound hauntingly familiar a century later. Immigration enforcement today includes factors ranging from the militarization of the border to massive detention facilities to, to 287G agreements between local law enforcement and ICE. Ours has also been a period of immigration federalism when local and state government enact laws and policies that target immigrants. Social workers may not be directly implicated in the assemblage of policies, procedures, and actors who comprise today's deportation machine. Individual practitioners and agencies, community-based organizations, schools, and hospitals may assume that if it doesn't affect their clients, immigration enforcement is not something they need to worry over. However, the ripple effects of immigration enforcement impact immigrants and non-immigrants across these contexts and institutions. And laws such as California's Prop 187 and Arizona's SB 1070 have threatened to hold social workers criminally liable uh, for providing services to undocumented immigrants and their families. Um, so I want to close um, by, I think, giving a similar call um, that that the social worker shouldn't just stand, stay by the immigrant, um, gritting her teeth or his teeth. Um, what does it mean for us today to um, to actually have a different voice? Um, and I think, to be honest with you, as um, someone who is white, who is a non-immigrant, a big part of my job um, is to speak out, but it's also to listen. Um, and to listen first, uh, I think that that's what, something that was missed in 1929 when Ernesto Galarza, Galarza stood up and, um, and spoke um, about the rights of Mexican origin immigrants. He humanized them. He um, challenged the way that social workers were um, dismissing the role that they may have to play um, in what eventually became the largest uh, repatriation program um, of this country. Um, so today, um, do you see, are you listening? And when appropriate, um, are you speaking out? Thank you. Thank you, Ben. That was another fascinating presentation and really a perfect follow-up to our first presentation. Um, I was particularly really fascinated at how it kind of added to what we heard in our first presentation about the social construction of race. Um, when Yusem said, when we talk about the social construction of race, that's not a metaphor. Um, you know, your presentation really emphasized that just the flexibility of the concept of race and whiteness over the years and how that flexibility has been just differentially applied to reinforce power um, among the people who became to be known as white. Um, and then I think the way you closed is a really important charge for all of us to think about how throughout history, social workers have contributed to um, anti-immigrant discourse. And, but even if we're not contributing to it, um, have we stood up against it? 
Um, that's something I think you know we've seen throughout your presentation, but it's really important to think about now um, when we're working in these spaces. So thank you very much. Um, and Ben, you'll be back at the close of this for some questions from our audience. And I'd like to welcome now to the stage our final presenter, um, Alicia Chatterjee. Alicia is an embodiment and mindfulness facilitator, an anti-intimate violence organizer, and a doctoral student at the University of Pennsylvania. And her presentation today is titled, Displacing a Community, Professionalizing a Practice, Race and Pathology in the Eviction of Malaga Island. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. So, hello all. My name is Alicia Chatterjee. I use she, her pronouns, and today I'm going to talk about the eviction of the people and families of a small island in coastal Maine called Malaga, which is pictured here in a 1910 photograph taken from the coast of the island. Before I begin, I want to locate myself, which is a practice that takes its cues from indigenous methodologies like those by Linda Tuchiwai Smith. As we speak of the history of white supremacy and social work in the first section of this symposium, I also want to imagine different practices that work to challenge some of the ways that white supremacy impacts our questions, our methods, and even our engagement with one another. My situation in this work is as a third generation person raised in coastal Maine, which is the ancestral lands of the Wabanaki peoples. And I'm born of a mixed race family of South Asian and European background. I was actually raised in large part on an island near Malaga in the only brown family I knew of on my island. And in my youth, I was told stories by my father about the black and brown people that used to live on Malaga Island. The work of this presentation stands on the shoulders of my intellectual mentors, John Jackson, Bonnie Duran, and Chris Manjapra, among others, including my own communities, and on the tireless efforts of activists in Maine and otherwise towards the liberation of black and indigenous peoples, queer and trans peoples, and all peoples. So in 1912, the state of Maine forcibly removed a small mixed race community of black indigenous um, Portuguese, which we're talking about the social construction of race at the time and white people, right, as distinct um, from Malaga Island. The island's community, which is right off of the coast of central Maine had been cultivated by these families from the mid 1800s until 1912. Between 1911 and 1912, the state forced the community from the island, destroying their homes and even unearthing their cemeteries, leaving some residents homeless and forcibly admitting others to the main school for the feeble-minded. The eviction was fueled by fear-driven narratives of the pathological immorality of Malaga residents, interracial relationships and women-led families, pauperism and financial dependence on the state and the charity of others. Here you catch a few photographic glimpses into life on Malaga, a family outside of their home on the island in 1911, and children attending the new Malaga Island School in 1910. So you may wonder, how does social work fit into the disturbing picture of this community's eviction just a year or two after these photographs were taken? At the turn of the 20th century, as we've seen in some ways in the previous presentation, social work was evolving out of a series of diverse practices into its more modern professional identity. While the settlement house movement, which from the 1880s to the 1920s is commonly understood as key to social work's development, the nascent field was also growing in relation to other movements, including missionary work and the expansion of asylums, which had begun in earnest in the mid 1800s. Um, settlement houses never reached Malaga, but missionaries did, and ultimately so did asylums. As a result, some Malaga residents were not just displaced, but committed to a locked asylum called Main School for the Feeble-Minded and later renamed Pineland. This treatment of the island's residents was rooted in logics of white supremacy, including anti-miscegenation, eugenics, and anti-blackness and indigeneity and it illuminates the pathologizing management of racialized communities at the turn of the 20th century. This makes mixed race community making a home of a small Northeastern island was figured as fit for control, not just through racialization, but through racialized pathology. As such, the state and social responses to the islanders entailed not only the people's subjugation, but their supposed treatment. Even though these events occurred on a marginal island in the Northeastern US, 
They provide us a salient example of how race and pathology were co-constructed and how in turn the logics of treatment in early social work and psychology were creating models of illness and treatment that were steeped in racism. Tracing the impacts of these early linkages, for example, psychiatrist Jonathan Metzl has done a lot of work explaining how today African-American people and men in particular are four times as likely to be diagnosed by a doctor with schizophrenia as a white patient is. He traces this history from drapetomania in the 1850s, a now infamous diagnosis that was given to enslaved peoples who dared to seek their freedom and literally attempted to define such flight from enslavement as a mental illness to the late 1960s when schizophrenia was defined by white psychiatry as um, quote unquote, a protest psychosis where black people demonstrated quote, hostile and aggressive feelings and delusional anti-whiteness, um, especially and specifically during civil rights protest. So from the turn of the century to the mid-century movements to the present, the link made between race and pathology also endure in social work education and practice. Malaga Island helps us as social workers understand and others understand our early history and continue the work of disentangling pathology, race, and identity by deepening our understanding of their entanglement in the first place. This research builds methodologically from the work of scholars like Sidia Hartman, whose most recent book examines the intimate lives of Black people living in Philadelphia and New York at the turn of the century. Um, and she engages early forms of social work note-taking as part of her archive. The archive that I'm working with in this work is deeply incomplete. Main historians I've spoken with have speculated about the strange absence of any records from what was main school for the feeble-minded and what until its closing in 1996 became Pineland. When Pineland closed, these records of racism and eugenics in the formation of the state of Maine were simply done away with. The records that do exist are sparse. In the work of this paper, I'm grappling with primary sources that include state council records regarding the Malaga eviction, a collection of newspaper articles primarily from the years 1893 to 1912 in reference to the island, and a book of missionary notes from Malaga. In her book, Hartman writes, quote, every historian of the multitude, the dispossessed, the subaltern, and the enslaved is forced to grapple with the power and authority of the archive and the limits it sets on what can be known, whose perspective matters, and who is endowed with the gravity and authority of historical actor. To deal with this reality of the archive, Hartman engages the historical actors in her text through the data that's available to her, and she also constructs what she calls liberatory counter narratives, engaging her own positionalities as a black woman and scholar to imagine the liberated voice of the historical actors in her text. This is just one method at reclaiming the subjugation of those racialized and pathologized in social and archival narrative. Certainly, I arrived to these archives with a methodological stance geared towards reading for the workings of power. And indeed, these workings are there in a multiplicity of ways, both past and present. We don't hear the narratives of the children pictured here, for example, even as we witness a moment in their lives through this photograph and an intimate one, they're in their home. Yet the pathologizing narratives of the newspapers, this one written even decades later in 1965, endure. As I've already introduced, this narrative points to the connections made between race and blackness and mixed raceness in particular, and pathology. Pathologization here is centrally understood as being a process of creating difference or otherness and later clinically codifying it against what's considered normal there are a number of identities and behaviors that were linked, especially through race, to pathology in the case of Malaga Island. These centrally include blackness, black and white and other mixed raceness, women-led families, um, women living together, unmarried couples cohabitating, and families receiving food and money from the state. So the people who first came to live on Malaga Island are believed to be descendants of Benjamin Darling, a black man who'd been formerly enslaved, and in his freedom, he became living on a nearby island in the late 1700s in, in Maine. He married a white woman of whom little is known, and it's their children who are believed to have been the first to live on Malaga. As noted in a newspaper article from 1893, Malaga was not the only island in the state inhabited by a small community of people. 
And though the island is certainly described as poor, it's described as similar in living conditions to comparable island communities at the time. You can see in the map on the right, the many small islands along coastal Maine near Malaga, which is highlighted here in blue. According to the records available to us, it was, however, the only island with black and other mixed race residents. Though the island was largely autonomous, if originally considered to be part of a local town, due to mounting public pressure, the state of Maine annexed the island in 1905, making its residents wards of the state. On the left-hand image right here, state council records denote the cost to, each, to the state of each family on the island. So in contemplation of the people's eviction, the state was completing human math, writing in line one, John Marx, with a family of six people and a nine month cost to the state of $185.07. Flashing forward, you might consider the ongoing surveillance and moralization in state and federal welfare provision. Still, though mixed race and black families had been living on the islands surrounding Malaga since the late 1700s, and on Malaga itself since the mid 1800s, it was not until the first decades of the 1900s that negative publicity about the island began to raise in the state of Maine and beyond throughout the, the East Coast. Around this time, the islands off of Maine were increasingly being sought after as summer homes and as sites for a nascent tourist industry. When the people of Malaga were evicted, in fact, it was intended that a luxury hotel would be built on the island, though this never came to fruition. What's more, the turn of the century saw many social and cultural shifts in the country. The time period was marked by the economic depression of the 1890s, industrialization, the rise of urbanization, and increased immigration and globalization. Social work was also professionalizing rapidly at this time. It was at the turn of the 20th century that social work began its professionalization from its earlier iterations of charitable giving, friendly visiting, and even political activism um, into casework and into scientific charity. Even so, as many of you know, social assistance was still organized and administered at the local level until the Great Depression and the 1935 Social Security Act. And we see the local nature of these helping structures with um, Malaga. In the picture on the right here is Captain and Mrs. Lane's notes about their experiences as missionaries and school teachers on the island. The book is titled History of Parts of Captain and Mrs. Lane and Their Daughter's Work Among Neglected People on Malaga Island, Maine, in reference to other localities where the new motorboat will make it easier for them to carry messages of love and helpfulness. The Lane family understood their role on the island as that of helpers, and even with, with love. The turn of the century was a time of great change, and the nascent social work field reflected it not to mention the newly alarmist responses to the so-called immorality and neglect of Malaga Island. In 1902, the newspaper Bath Enterprise published a story titled, Life on Malaga, Not Fit for Dogs. They write of Malaga, quote, its population is a degraded class, black and white, all mixed up with the lowest kind of moral ideas. It remains a disgrace to the town and to the state of Maine that such a condition of things is allowed to exist as is reported to be on the island, which now awaits to be redeemed from poverty, filth, and immorality. Here is an excellent opportunity for practical missionary work right here at hand." End quote. Here, we see the racialized and racist language describing Malaga Island, a community of black and white people all mixed up as unfit for dogs. The direct connection between blackness and mixed race families to immorality is also clear here as is the resulting call for the Islanders' redemption. A 1905 article reflects on the mixed race nature of the island and raises concerns about women's work. The article writes, they're now a strange mixture of black and white. The women do most of the work. They dig the clams and catch lobsters. In a written letter by Mrs. M.J. Fultz, the wife of a local minister, calls for missionary work on the island, writing, quote, on going to the shore, we found a mixed class of black, and white people all mingling together. Some of them had been married by the justice of the peace while others lived together without license. They seemed to be getting along very well outside of their moral conditions. These letters and articles highlight the contours of the immorality that were actively being socially created. You'll notice the repetitiveness of the language spanning across these articles, authors and years. 
and being attached to Malaga. They describe blackness, they describe mingling together, women working, and in many other cases, pauperism, um, which is described some in these articles that I have pictured here. Still, even as they describe poverty, the letter from Mrs. M.J. Foltz also admits that the island was, aside from their morality, getting along very well. For it was in fact also in 1902 that an article was published describing how both nearby towns had prevented Malaga residents from receiving a marriage license and a bill was passed making it illegal for the people of Malaga to dig clams in the mudflats near their island. At the very same time that cries of alarm about the pauperism on the island were on the rise, Malaga residents were being systematically prevented from harvesting their sustenance. Malaga was being targeted and socially constructed through multiple avenues, the literal and systemic limiting of their livelihoods and the social and cultural creation of racist and pathologizing narrative. In the Journal of Missionaries from Boston, Captain and Mrs. Lane, who lived on the island in the summertime of the early 1900s, you saw the title of that earlier, <laughs> the Lane family writes of their work with the young people on the island. Mrs. Lane recalls a 1904 visit with a Maine state agent, Mr. Smith, and his affirmation of the important work she was doing in her educational endeavors on the island in the absence of a formal school because there was no school on Malaga. She writes, he, he, which is Mr. Smith, also says that what is taught in the common school is but a small part of what should be taught to them, the students in Malaga. There should be domestic science, manual training, and above all moral training. He did not think it advisable to take them away unless they were feeble-minded. Then they should be placed where the state has provided for such. We are all very much pleased and gratified with our conference with Mr. Smith. The children did real well and I was proud of them." End quote. Here, we again find the insistence of the importance of moral training for those on Malaga Island. While at the same time, it appears Mrs. Lane and Mr. Smith agreed that residents of Malaga should not be taken to the home for the feeble-minded, it was certainly in the realm of their consideration. Were any of the residents ultimately deemed to be feeble-minded? Already, the connections between Black and mixed-race identities, financial troubles, and women-led activities were strongly linked to immorality. Even as Mrs. Lane participates in some of these linkages, she reflects with pride and care upon the children and her work with them. And that's where it's important to recognize how care and harm are not mutually exclusive. In the coming years, the island's very existence and community practices would be linked to pathology in evolving ways, leading some Malaga families to commitment in the asylum. In these scrapbooked images, Mrs. Lane reflects on the work she had done with Abby Tripp since she arrived, titling the images, Abby as she was on the left and Abby now. In the first image, we see Abby staring out at the photographer with a look to me of defiant concern. The image shows scales of darkness, the yard, the dress, Abby's face and the nearly hidden face of her younger sister to the left. In the next picture, photographed in fuller light, Abby is literally dressed in white with her hair apparently styled in the supposed care of Mrs. Lane, also pictured there. Mrs. Lane's notes mark her perception of Abby's transformation under Mrs. Lane's care. Though sparse, some records seem to indicate that those who viewed themselves to be helpers on the island did not necessarily support the islanders' eviction. Remember, many islanders were not committed to the home for the feeble-minded and were instead left homeless, rejected by nearby towns. Though they may not have supported these evictions, the helpers on the island did, however, participate actively in the islanders' characterization as immoral and in need of saving and treatment. And it is precisely here at the power-laden intersection of helping and harm that the field of social work must cast its historical and present attention. So I wanna close with another departure from traditional uh, method taking cues from the work of Hartman, as I previously described. Because the archive is incomplete and subjugating, written from the perspective of those with the power of the record, Hartman engages the tools of her own presence to imagine narratives liberated from the archive itself. My question here is how can we listen for history that has been made invisible? Towards that effort, I wanna read a poem by Julia Bausma, Bausma is a main poet whose 2018 book, Midden, imagines kinds of liberated narratives from Malaga. 
I want to read to you her poem about Abby Tripp. We've looked at Abby through many layers of power, or we might say through a power-laden gaze. We see her through the gaze of the photographer who took her picture, the gaze of Mrs. Lane who saved the photos in her scrapbook, and then through our own gazes today. With this poem, might we feel Abby looking back at us. The Tray of Spades. At six, Abby knows to stay behind the fence rails. Though she twists up on the corner post, tries to grow her body bigger, keeps her eyes down, things you do in front of any strange animal. Every step of this yard is hers. The hills, her bare arched feet press into graveled clay, make a map of her flesh, a geography of peeled sunlight and cedar bark. But the arm holding the black box to the white man's eyes casts a shadow over the grass, the daisies fades them to flower sack. As little Pearly mouths the rail beside her, peeks out through the stick fence, and old Annie Parker creaks her chair. A rhythm, Abby breathes in like the sound of the sea as she weaves her toes into the dust, digs in her heels. She could follow her feet out of this gate, scrabbling over the rocks and broken shells to the bay. Instead, she braids her palms to the top of the fence post, elbows bent to the rails, torn dress falling all around her, loose and streaked as eater wings. The white man lifts his black box again, says, stand still. The flashbulb glints 100 teeth in an open mouth. The camera is a crack door anyone can open. Last winter, the frost heaves swelled like a frown beneath Annie's house, corner post shifting until a door wouldn't latch and she tried to shut it with a rope. Now she pulls Pearly onto her lap. Sometimes the restless heat of a child's limbs will keep the cold out, hold the ghosts at bay. Her face is a haze of brush smoke, acrid snap of pine pitch, lips collecting in creosote pools as she glares the camera down. Annie knows no good ever, Abby knows no good ever comes of a mainlander staring into your open door. Afterward, the picture finds its way to Boston where it's cropped and stamped, the postcard. It sells and sells. So that is my presentation for today. Thank you. And I look forward to discussion. Thank you, Alicia. That was really fascinating. And I think is a story, the story of Malaya Island is not one that's told as often as it should be. So I really appreciate you bringing it to the attention of so many people who are watching today. I thought it was particularly interesting to hear about, this was the first presentation that really talked about how this concept of morality um, which is largely constructed by white people, informs these racialized narratives and is used to uh, construct this anti-immigrant or negative um, conversation um, as it relates to, to non-white people. Um, so thanks very much for your presentation. I want to bring our other panelists in so we can have some Q&A that have been um, coming up in uh, the chat room. And we're going to start with a question for Dr. Park um, from Jennifer Elkins. I would also be interested in hearing Dr. Park's thoughts on the need for a truth and reconciliation process for the social work profession and our complicity historically, and I think that's as currently. Um, am I on? It sounds yep. like a great idea. <laughs> Um, but I, I guess, you know, I feel like, yes, it sounds like a great idea, but there's so much work that needs to be done to first uncover our history. Um, so, I mean, I too had never heard of Malaga Island, for instance. Um, I was really happy to see Ben's paper because, um, it was secretly is one of the things that I've been really wanting to study. Um, I think that, um, the larger history of, uh, I keep thinking that there has to be, um, have been social workers involved in um, boarding schools all across the country. Mm -hmm. And I really, really have been hoping that um, uh, somebody would study the question. Um, and so there's so much to our history that we don't know about. And, and I think, and I'm really happy to see these, um, see this presentation today and, and also going on um, on um, Friday because I feel like we've been moving away from our history and, and any discipline that is worth its name um, has to have a reflexive arm, right? So if we don't know 
um, where we've, we've come from and how we've arrived at the place that we have arrived, then how do we actually formulate anything that even you know the least bit resembles something that's not going to be harmful? Um, truth and reconciliation, I guess there's one way to do it. I do also hope that um, So much of what we do and so many of the assumptions about how we think about our work needs to be first examined. So yeah, I think it's a great idea, but I think it is it is a, um, in order to get there, I think there's so much work for the profession to do before. Right. Absolutely, thanks. <clears throat> okay, I think we have a question for Ben next. Are we waiting for it to appear? I think I know what it is. Okay. I can read it. It's how did this work influence affect your um, you and your understanding of yourself as a white American? I mean, I'm a migration scholar, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about um, migration broadly and migration from Latin America specifically. I think um, what what this awakened for me was the temptation to point my finger at all the ridiculous language and thinking and the sort of creation and recreation of these social fissures in the at these meetings by professional social workers and other leaders in the field and to say i would never um and i think what it what it did for me is force me to say you know i don't would i stand up and be a part of that um that group that is spiritedly debating um during ernesto galarza's um, talk, for example, in 1929. Because um, I think, um, I mean, I agree with um, Professor Park's comment that that we have to be looking back at history. And yet I think, uh, for me at least, as someone who is in a place of, uh, like, like my whiteness is on full display. Um, and, you know, I have, um, I have that, you know, sort of that position. And what what do I do with it? How do I recognize it? And it's easy for me to say, oh, I'm doing a great job um, because I would, you know, certainly I would have stood up at those meetings and spoken out. Um, and I think, um, I think what it's forced me to do is to, is to continue to, um, to be thinking about what are my blinders? Cause I have them. Um, and even though I've been studying migration for a couple of decades, it doesn't mean that somehow my whiteness doesn't show up in how I write and how I think um, and how I present my material. Um, and and I think, you know, what, what's become even more important to me in recent months, not necessarily because of this paper, but um, but just in my work in general, is the conversation that I'm having with colleagues whose life experiences are um, very different than me, um, whether because of any of the axes of um, identity. And, um, and to continually say, no, no, I'm not there yet. I need to continue to listen and learn how to um, identify the blinders that I have. Um, and I, cause I, I don't know, it's just, it's too easy to look back and to feel a little bit um, like I've arrived mm -hmm. and, and that's just not the case. Um, so I, that's my long winded response. Right. Okay. Thanks. Um, I think we have this one for Alicia, but I think it could be probably you all could answer it because of the, how your work focuses. Why do you think historical research is not valued in social work education and scholarship? Alicia, you want to take that one first? Sure. Um, I mean, I think that in my experience, and I'm also a current doctoral student, so I can definitely like speak to it from the framing of a current student, which um, there's a lot of focus on um, research and evidence-based practice, which was another question that we had received as well. And I think kind of moving into this like social scientific stance within the field that can kind of obfuscate um, like critical theoretical work as well as historical research in our, in our field. Um, you know, research that orients away from quantitative methods of understanding or, um, you know, orients towards some of these questions of power and identity, harm, violence, right? Because as soon as you look into history, that's what you're looking at. Um, I mean, you look in the present, that's what you're looking at too, but you certainly are looking at it in the history as we have all shown today. So, you know, I think that um, 
I think there's a that's that's a quick sort of response to that question, but I think there are a number of factors at play, and that is that is one. Mm -hmm. Any other ideas related to that question? I mean, I've written um, I've at least two or three editorials for Ophelia on the. Um, that is one color heart, I guess. I mean, it, we only have to look at how um, the, the business models of social work schools. Um, and, you know, uh, historical projects do not get NIH funding. Um, and as long as we are really dependent on, on that business model, um, certain kinds of work get valorized. Um, and I think it's also, there's a, you know, I mean, I, I work out of a very much Foucauldian notion that um, you do history because it illuminates the present. So history of the present is is why it should be done. Um, and I think that kind of alternative, I think, um, is is not valued. And um, the kind of analysis that that Alicia was doing, um, very much focused on power, um, very much non-positivist. Um, uh, all that work is hugely undervalued. And, and I think I wrote in my um, latest editorial, which is my last editorial actually, um, that it's, it's, it's a cycle, right? So um, you can't get a job um, as doing this kind of work. It's, it's increasingly more difficult. And then it's, it's harder to get tenure to do this, doing this kind of work. So it becomes a sideline, and which means that then you have um, lots of programs where you don't have anybody who can teach this kind of stuff to um, to doctoral students. And then so either explicitly or implicitly, doctoral students and junior faculty are discouraged from going down this path. Um, and then I think you know part of it is that I think you know over and over and over, um, social workers tend to think that we are somehow kinder and gentler than the rest of the population. And if you look at our history, that simply has not been true. We are like um, any other part, part of the population, which is we are bound by the discourses of our times, right? So thus we need to study it. But um, yeah, I'm taking up too much time, so I will stop there. But um, the business model is, is a really simple answer. Yeah, I think that's been really clear today, just the problems in the academy and what we value. Um, particularly when it comes to tenure expectations and things like that, so thanks. I think we have one question here for Alicia. As we've moved from the moral to the authoritative to the evidence-based perspectives, what are your thoughts on the current orientation to the evidence-based framework of social work? So I, I think I, I touched on that a little bit too in, in what I, I had previously mentioned, but I think that, um, you know, to me, and, and I'm also a, a have come to this work through doing clinical work as a practitioner and a clinician. And so to me, there's sort of this following from, you know, EBP comes out of medical uh, practice, right? So there's sort of this following in line with um, those practice goals and that may or may not fit with actually what, I mean, what might be some of the more liberatory or generative possibilities within social work might be, right? As we're, as we're discussing. Um, but, you know, I think that there are I think that the research, you know, the positivist, which is a better way to frame it than just quantitative, right? But that some of the frameworks of how we think about or understand knowledge definitely connect back to the ways that we've thought about knowledge all along, right? And how we've defined other people and how, and those definitions come into absolute play in terms of how we measure um, concepts to produce evidence-based practice. So I think it's a really great question. Great, thanks. And I think we have one more for all the panelists. Yeah, to all of the panelists, what practices can white scholars employ to be more mindful or inclusive of BIPOC perspectives? <laughs> yeah, I feel like the white guy should speak up, shouldn't they? Go ahead. Um, Okay, so it's, I don't have some formula um, that has worked for me or, you know, um, you know, so, so what practices can white scholars employ? I think we've been talking about a number of them, um, right? I mean, um, Yusin used the word reflexivity. Um, um, Alicia has been pointing to the importance of, um, of, locating your scholarship and, and kind of the larger 
dynamic of power and control. And, and we've been using terms like discourse um, and how the language that we use fundamentally shapes the way that we think about and articulate questions we ask. Um, so I think for me, as I've gotten deeper into my own career, um, it's become easier to get entrenched in a certain sort of um, way of thinking, a certain um, theoretical I mean, body of theory um, and, and knowledge. And that's not bad. That's what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to be continuing to drill down and to establish that we have this expertise as scholars. Um, but I think the, the danger for me as someone who, um, I mean, I guess this applies for any of us, but particularly for um, in given um, my own whiteness, it's um, going back to what I said earlier, it's the fact that I'm, I'm, I, I'm overlooking um, certain voices in my, and what I read and, 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 and in how I read it. Um, and I think um, what I've needed to do as a scholar, as someone who is white, is to remain in conversation and find people who are going to push me because I'm not, it's not easy for me just to push myself out of those um, sort of entrenched ways of thinking. Um, and, and so I think um, it's so hard to, to say this without sounding trite and formulaic, but, but that's been, um, that, that has helped me um, is by surrounding myself um, with um, friends, scholars who say, yeah, that, um, that, that doesn't fly and here's why, or why did you say it that way? Can you, you know, and helping me locate how whiteness continues to show up in what I say and what I do, not so that I can put a stop to it or something or, or like pretend that that's not who I am, um, but so that I, um, that kind of awareness, I think is something that I've really needed to continue to develop. Uh, and will, I think that's a lifelong career long task. Um, I don't know, maybe others have some, some insights on this, but those are some thoughts that I have. Thanks. Any other ideas as we have last couple minutes? I, I guess I just want to challenge Ben a little bit on um, this idea that you rely on other people. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I imagine people of color to push you, um, which then puts the work back on um, brown and black bodies. Um, and I guess something that I tell my students all the time is um, to think of anti-racism work, racial justice work, as something that we do for black and brown people um, is a problem. So I think we really need to shift our thinking. And so what I would argue for is, is even the question that, that, that it was, it's an interesting question and I think it's an important one that got um, put out, but I think to reframe that and, and what I would always argue for is um, look, for, look for the functioning of power. So what, what white people, what, what all of us should be doing as social work scholars is really to analyze the dynamic of power um, and, and to really even question this notion of BIPOC perspective versus white perspectives. Um, so, so it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think, what are the assumptions underneath that question, right? What are the, what are the assumptions in, in our ability to actually say those sentences? And, and so we should be analyzing the power dynamics there and, and not take those ideas as, as settled. Um, or, or, or I hope that makes it some sense because I know we're out of time, but um, yeah. Thank you. So thank you all for your excellent presentations today. I really appreciate you being part of this panel. Um, as a reminder, we'll be back here tomorrow, um, same time, 1230 Eastern um, for the continuation of part one of this symposium. Tomorrow we're going to have two panels in a similar format as we had today. The first panel will be on reckoning with coercion, legacies of white supremacy. And then our next panel will be agents of segregation, social workers and urban spaces. So please come back tomorrow, 1230 Eastern, 1130 Central, 930 Pacific um, for the continuation of part one of this symposium. And then before we leave, please, um, just a reminder that part two of our symposium, um, please save the date for January 28th and 29th. Again, same time, 1230 Eastern, same place. Um, and part two of our symposium is titled Addressing Racism from Within the Social Work Profession, Reflections on Our Past and Present, which will look at how we as a profession have tried to confront 
the racism that exists in our profession, where we've been able to bring about change, and where we still have work to do. So January 28th and 29th, same time, same place, but please be back tomorrow, um, 1230 Eastern, for the continuation of part one, where we're looking at our historical legacy of racism and white supremacy. Thank you all, and I hope you have a great evening. See you tomorrow.